Charlie was first documented when someone snapped a photo of his initial escape from a meat processing plant. Now, you're probably wondering, what even is a Big Charlie? This creature's DNA analysis revealed that it is a man-made genetic hybrid of both chicken and cow, the ultimate meat product abomination. No longer will my McGangbang have to come from two different animals. Its body resembles that of an emaciated cow with its ribcage tightly encased by leathery skin. This creature can reach up to 30 feet or 9 meters tall. Its legs are structured like those of a chicken, and its head has a cow skull shape with a beak-like protrusion for a mouth. Big Chungus's eyes are cloudy and milky white, like those of your friend's really old dog that he insists can still actually stand up, but you're not so sure. These hybrids are still in production around the United States, and their meat as well as other products like milk and eggs are being sold to consumers in America and overseas as well. You can't tell me you didn't already have a suspicion that something was up about your food. Take a bite of a McDonald's hamburger and tell me it tastes anything like a hamburger you make at home. Yeah, I still bought this, f you. Oat? Milk? Yeah, okay, show me the nipple on an oat. You f***ers have been consuming Big Charlie's this whole time. I'm telling you though, the meat is delicious when you actually prepare it right instead of just mixing it with dog food ingredients like your fast food places. Despite its totally radical entire body mohawk, this entity has never displayed aggressive tendencies towards humans. While he might seem frightening due to his appearance, think about how smart a cow is, and then think about how smart a chicken is. This guy is somewhere in between there. This thing's primary concern is eating things off the ground. I bet you feel about as dumb as him for being scared now, don't you? It's not really all that threatening of a creature compared to the rest of the crap that I drag y'all to. Although, cows do consistently kill humans on a scale that outweighs pretty much any other animal. This creature has one more unexplainable ability, that of fleshy asexual reproduction. This creature drops flesh blobs that will develop into one of multiple forms. If you were Big Charlie, your left boob would fall off and grow legs and become its own sentient creature while you rapidly grew the left boob back. The first of these three forms is a perfect clone of Big Charlie, the second of which is called Lil Nugget. I'm not talking about that vertically challenged Atlanta rapper that fell into a deep fryer. I'm talking about a small amorphously shaped creature with four nubbins it uses to walk around on and two comically large oval eyes. Lil Nuggets act like cockroaches or rats and survive inside human settlements by stealing their food and resources and nesting in their walls. I'd nest in your walls. Aside from the destruction to environments that regular pests create, these are basically harmless, and they can even be domesticated if you feed and take care of them. The lamb is a different story. The lamb is a monstrosity that looks to be made from veins and other vascular structures. Okay, so you know those bodybuilders that have skin so tight that all of their skin looks like veiny dick skin? It's like that big pile of veins, but without the skin. It levitates in the air using some form of telekinesis, but this is just the tip of the iceberg of what it is capable of. It can cause psychic damage to the brains of any creature in its vicinity. This includes psychological slash emotional damage, but it can also just literally burst your gray matter. Make your head go It's also capable of causing all the blood in a creature to instantly clot, causing the veins in its body to explode under the pressure of gelatinous blood, causing the skin to become reddish in hue. This creature, like any other cool unknowable horror, is worshipped by a cult of followers. There's also triple question mark nugget, but when people pressed lead paranormal researcher Trevor Henderson for information regarding this new discovery, he kept saying, we don't talk about him. I know what that means. It's either that he's buried in Trevor Henderson's backyard, or he traumatized Trevor to a point he can never recover and his brain made up a bunch of random monsters as a defense mechanism. Siren Head. Bullhorn Slenderman. Speaker Face. A monstrosity known by many names, Siren Head is a tall skeletal humanoid creature with a long pole and multiple sirens in place of a head and neck. 
No shit. These sirens have a set of gums and teeth on the inside of them. Its skin is tightly wrapped around its bones like a kid in a trash bag with a vacuum. Siren Head has dry, papery skin, like the leaf of a backwoods. Speaking of, am I the only one that thinks that loose shredded tobacco looks like a bunch of collecting pubic hairs? Just me? Okay. It's thought that like a stick bug, the Siren Head has evolved to look exactly like telephone wire poles in order to blend into the environment. Siren Heads are apex predators in both forests and any environment with plentiful human human infrastructure, consuming every creature they come across like that fisherman guy that catches random ocean fish and then eats them raw to test if they're poisonous. Even if they've already been established as poisonous. That's real and it's called this. You're welcome. There's this myth going around that Siren Head doesn't eat. It's actually that he doesn't need to eat. He eats humans and animals just because he's a sick f and thinks it's pretty funny. Siren Head has no eyes. And while some claim that he can still see, like the common bat or Stevie Wonder, this creature moves and locates prey using echolocation, sending out indetectable pulses of sound constantly and receiving accurate feedback as to where your dumbass is hiding. The two sirens on its head will often speak in unison and throw out seemingly random words and numbers in a static-filled echoey electronic hum. This creature is also capable of replicating any noise that it hears, including human speech, animal calls, and of course, sirens, digital, and other mechanical noises. Bring a bucket and a mop for this wet-ass viewer. Siren Head seems to be more intelligent than your average human. You gotta be smart to get a human out of their house if you look like the result of someone tripping balls on mushrooms on Halloween night and seeing an especially creepy telephone pole. The noises that he uses to lure victims will change from person to person. Similar to a skinwalker, Siren Head often uses the voices or screams for help of a loved one or any other voice that it thinks could manipulate a victim into leaving safety. It will also specialize the noises by stalking a victim for a series of weeks to understand its behavior. Many paranormal researchers theorize that the Siren Head belongs to a larger collection of similar humanoid creatures. There have been documentations of lamppost heads, telephone pole heads, and 5G cell station heads, just to name a few. That's right, that crazy swamp lady that burnt down the 5G tower was actually defending you from Siren Heads, and you all just went and put her in jail. Now look at all the places that he has to hide. Siren Heads Rise to Fame mirrors another internet horror celebrity, Slenderman. Often being called the new Slenderman, this has made the actual Slenderman quite bitter. He was already behaving erratically, as he had slid into alcoholism as so many former child stars do. In a blind drunken rage, Slenderman attempted to run down Siren Head in his car, which was documented by a bunch of 10 year olds writing Slenderman vs. Siren Head fanfics. <laughs> Throw rocks through your windows, you dumb whore. Hey Satana, add polycephalic human skeletons to my shopping list. I've added polycephalic human skeleton to your shopping list. The Feated King is a cognito hazard image that manifests an aggressive skeletal entity of the same name. This entity has a few strands of hair that it desperately combs over in a sad attempt to claim that it's under 30,000 years old. He also wears a crown that seemingly rises out of the bone on top of the skull itself. This image was originally a painting. When someone would view this art, the Feated King entity would emerge from the canvas, grabbing the victim and dragging them into a pocket-sized dimension within the artwork. In this fun-sized hell, the victim will be submerged into a sea of maggots until there is nothing left but bone. If there is any flesh left, it looks like the skin on the knee of that kid that won't let his injuries heal because he keeps picking the scabs off to eat them. Some researchers believe that the Feated King just wants more skeleton friends. While he sounds fearsome, you can just avoid him by staying out of arm's reach or not looking at him at all. When someone, whether it was a deranged lunatic looking to end humanity or an idiot that just didn't get close enough to die and posted it on Instagram, took a photo and uploaded it to the internet Internet, the properties followed. This turned what was a vaguely threatening piece of canvas that you could incapacitate by facing towards the wall into an omnipotent being capable of tracing down and destroying any human with any semblance of connection to the modern world. It started to spread itself in numerous newly created social media accounts and even edit the files and settings on devices to turn the image into the home screen, signifying that this entity was conscious and wanted to kill as many people as possible. I actually have the original image saved on my hard drive as it's a lot easier to send an email than it is to put a hit out on someone. Just remember, if you f*** with me, I'll kill you with only a meme. The image I am using to depict this entity in the video has been modified for your safety. 
I'd show the real one to you, but then who would watch my videos? See, it's a lot less easy to keep this spooky skeleton man at arm's reach when he can occupy a device that's designed for use in your hands. The one hilarious thing about the Feated King is that it manifests with size in respect to the device that it comes from. So if it does happen to come from your phone, it's gonna be a titty tiny little guy trying to murder you. Adorable. However, the Feated King is always incredibly strong regardless of its size, and is able to pull a full-grown man through a computer monitor via brute force, even if limbs need to be severed in the process. If some psycho rents an electronic billboard in Town Hall, things are gonna get real messy real fast, and I will be watching one giant arm's distance away with popcorn and beer. Bridgeworms are mysterious ambush predators located across the majority of the North American continent. These worms are often discovered by unlucky urban explorers that stick their nose inside the wrong place at the wrong time, like that one incident with the butthole. These creatures have a long worm-like body covered in a layer of sickly-looking gray skin with a waxy shine to it. They have two large arms protruding from each side, which they use for dragging themselves along using walls of tunnels like a lubed-up man crawling quickly across a slip-and-slide. They also use these arms to secure prey and bring it inside their face holes for consumption. The bridge worm usually resides in bridges, tunnels, sewers, subways, abandoned buildings, and rarely in natural caves. Like you and I, this creature very much enjoys slippery holes. This creature preys upon the majority of large North American fauna, but has a tendency to reside in man-made areas and target humans. It's theorized that this predator not only targets humans, but has evolved over millions of years to favor humans as prey. It's thought that this creature needs the large mass of gray matter that is most present in human brains. Evidence for this evolutionary relationship can be seen in its false face adaptation. Kinda like dealing with someone on the street handing out their quote unquote free mixtape, or a girl who's only on Tinder to promote her OnlyFans, you shouldn't be fooled by this false face. Its gray skin opens up just under the chin of the creature, creating a retractable flap. This flap has a fake vaguely humanoid face on it. When ambushing its prey, it retracts this flap to reveal its true face, which is a blood red skeletal face eerily similar in bone structure to a human human skull. While it was theorized that this was designed to fool humans as a manipulation of their hard-coded facial recognition patterns in their brains, this theory falls apart when you realize that most humans are smart enough to know it's not a person if it's a giant worm with an uncanny valley face. Keyword most. Instead, I theorize that it is not designed to trick humans, but instead to pique their curiosity, taking advantage of the human's natural proclivity to seek knowledge even if it puts them in danger. What's that saying? Curiosity killed the cat, and also that transient, that taxi driver, that paranormal investigator. As they age, their faces get more and more human-like, and some of them attach themselves inside of their habitat like some sort of horrible roadway snail. Another adaptation that suggests the bridge worm specializes in human hunting is that it oozes a thick slime. This not only lubricates its body to slide through tunnels, but it also serves to make the road incredibly slippery, causing many more accidents. Numerous corporations have captured and farmed these worms to milk them of their lubricant and sell them as intercourse aids worldwide. When the slime freezes in the winter, this accident rate skyrockets. After causing a car crash, this creature will rip the doors from the vehicle and pull the prey out of the car and devour it like my rabbi did with my foreskin after I was circumcised. The largest recorded bridge worm on record was over 1,500 feet, and was the culprit responsible for some of the numerous New York railway transit disappearance from 1994 to 1998. Bridge worms usually keep to isolated areas to avoid detection by human masses. Nothing on your planet is more dangerous than a big group of humans under groupthink. Although, when food is scarce, the worms will sometimes relocate in search of more, sometimes across vast distances. There have been a few rare instances of bridge worms entering cities and large towns. For example, the most infamous incident in 1998 in which a bridge worm followed the train tracks from rural New York directly into Grand Central, consuming railway workers, drunken humans, and homeless street performers in the subway only to be cut in half by an express train from Connecticut before it could reach the high population transit center. I actually witnessed this, but in the moment, after the night I had, I wasn't sure if I actually saw a train cut a giant worm with human arms in half, or I was just a bit too gone and needed some sleep. 
What is strange is that there are no evolutionary trees which the bridge worm would fit into, as it has no known species relatives. How the bridge worm came into existence is a complete mystery. Some say it's related to snakes or worms, some say it was created in a laboratory, some, as humans always do, say it's got something to do with the occult or the paranormal. Examining its genetic lineage is like going on TikTok. Rarely have I opened TikTok and I was like, yeah, that was a valuable use of my time. Most of the time I just open it to post and spend like 15 minutes and I'm staring at memes and thirst traps and I'm like, shit. I've been tricked. What the hell am I talking about again? I would advise against searching for the bridge worm due to the fact that you're their primary source of food that millions of years of evolution have bred them to be the perfect ambush predator for you idiot. I decided to message my associate and take this investigation into my own hands. The following is the message log leading up to the expedition. Yo, where's the abandoned house? In the woods. I need some footage. We need to find the bridge worm, motherfucker. This guy. Where? Oh, you're asking me? I'm down to do that tonight. Blair Witch Project. Yeah, I'm asking you, lol. We need to find the fuck bridge worms. Redacted. If we believe hard enough and get high enough, it will be real. Hey man, you don't gotta tell me twice. Lift today? I'm glad you understand the importance of this matter. Also down. Lift today, dinner, vodka, wander into the woods. The Sea Eater is an eyeless, ocean-dwelling creature of unknown length. While the Sea Eater is far too large to fit into any body of water other than the deep ocean, this still doesn't mean that you should feel safe on the toilet. On each side, there are massive limbs that resemble arms, except with webbed extremities. This creature navigates on sonar alone, and it's thought that it's responsible for the famous yet unidentified bloop recording. Shut the fuck up, Animal Planet. It's not fucking mermaids. Anyways, if humans were smart, they'd just nuke this big stupid fucker with sonar and get it over with. Get rid of all the whales too while you're at it. This creature consumes anything it comes across, including but not limited to small to large sea fauna ranging from clouds of plankton to pods of whales, ocean vessels such as boats, cruise ships, aircraft carriers, and submarines, and other ocean megafauna such as the Marianas Trench Megalodon population. The tip of this creature's gaping maw is just above 32,000 feet high when it rarely breaches the surface. This trait gets even more unsettling when one realizes that airplanes fly at around 30,000 feet. One of the rare direct surface encounters with this creature was found in the black box of an airplane that was swallowed and found full of skeletons in a giant legendary undersea turd. It's thought that this creature moves by dragging itself along the seafloor with its giant uncanny valley arms. While this behemoth seems like it would be slow if it was dragging its belly across the floor like a morbidly obese slug, it can actually reach speeds of up to 575 miles per hour. The probably 10 year old on the fandom writes that it's faster, but how am I supposed to make this that stupidly overpowered when the document reads, Sea Eater once fought Slithering Doom and Sea Eater 1. It eats anything, even large size, which helps it to catch flying creatures like manta and flying vehicles. Undersea, it eats creatures plankton and even feed on vertebrates and invertebrates. He can eat every ocean ever. You dare question my flawlessly written lore? I am the Sea Eater. Consumer of the deep. Nice to meet you, Seacup. I'm as fuck consumer of Red Bull vodkas. Why aren't you freaking out? Peter, if you saw my search history and learned what I got off to, you'd have nightmares for weeks. Amazon makes it like way too easy to buy like a literal machete as a child. And I know because I did it. If you thought the Sea Eater was powerful, the World Eater is so powerful that by comparison, it makes the Sea Eater look like that daddy long legs that I pulled all the legs off as a kid and then cried when I realized what I had done to that poor vibrating gray ball. The World Eater is a gargantuan mass consisting of a main body and face and an uncountable amount of tendrils and insectoid limbs stemming from it. At the front of this body, there is a human-like mouth with insect-like mandibles stemming from each side. Look at this big smile. Such a happy guy when it's his snack time. Just above this gaping maw, the surface of the face is dotted with dozens of milky white eyes of various sizes. The body segment also extends backwards into a tail-like structure for what looks to be eternity, but is likely just a few thousand miles. The world 
world eater, as its name suggests, eats worlds, idiot. This creature will feast on an entire planet, leaving nothing behind, and then it will simply move on to the next. Its endless appetite has consumed many solar systems, and will consume many more as it drifts throughout the cosmic void searching for its next meal. It's likely that the world eater will eventually encounter and devour the sea eater. What is this, a crossover episode? And also you and everyone you know. This one kind of reminds me of the Junji Ito manga. What's it called? Hellstar Ramina. Yeah, this whole creature gives me a lot of Lovecraft vibes too. You know what's weird? A lot of people think that Lovecraft was squeamish towards sex, and you can see this in his work. Like how he made a fertility god, the equivalent to a horrific sentient fleshy termite egg sac hive full of gods. If you're a true literary scholar, you can look past this and realize that H.P. Lovecraft definitely had a fetch for sticking his penis into random insect hives and getting it all bit up and sh**. What the hell is it talking about again? This is the cum eater. It, e it eats cum, the end. Cartoon Cat is a tall, slender, anthropomorphic black cat-like creature with cartoonish proportions and features. It has white soulless eyes with black pupils and white gloves similar to that of Control the Entire World Mouse. Like fans of FNAF, furries that want to fuck slashers are the most common victims of Cartoon Cat. Some believe that Cartoon Cat was sent as punishment for humanity's anthropomorphic sexualized cartoon representations of animals. Oh yeah, and his teeth are consistently stained with blood. When pressed as to why, he said don't worry about it. So I'm not gonna worry about it. The creature does not usually display typical feet, instead having sharp points at the ends of their legs. Finally, a solution for those who have both feet and knife fetishes. Cartoon Cat can change his form, size, and body at will. Its arms and legs can extend almost indefinitely, allowing it to reach high windows where you sleep with ease. The creature's limbs can squash and stretch like that of a typical 1930s rubber hose era cartoon. Except without all the racist parts that make everybody uncomfortable, his entire body seems to be malleable as if it were made of some sort of solidified goo. The creature seems to be emulating Felix the Cat, a cartoon that ended around the 1930s. In the Felix the Cat Wikipedia article, it details the struggles and decline of the show's creator, which is incredibly sad, right? At the time of Googling Felix the Cat, I had not read this article. And I scrolled down to why did Felix the cat end? And it said, he slumped into an alcoholic depression. His health rapidly declined and his memory began to fade. He could not even cash checks to Mesmer because his signature was reduced to a mere scribble. He died in 1933. But my dumbass thought it was referring to Felix the cat. And I was like, they wrote that in the show? On a drunk AMA Trevor did on his Twitter, he revealed that Cartoon Cat loves to commit violent atrocities. Oh, to be drunk on an AMA, Trevor's doing it right. He has not revealed much about Cartoon Cat, likely because he knows the truest fear is fear of the unknown. Cartoon Cat is considered to be so dangerous that other monsters avoid areas that he tends to frequent. Not me though, this cat is just a big pussy just like every other. It's theorized that Cartoon Cat has unknown metaphysical abilities that allow him such power. Cartoon Cat, and any other cartoon monster for that matter, can take the distorted form of almost any animal. But since dogs, mice, and cats are the animals that usually come to mind when cartoons are mentioned, these are the forms that are most often used. Cartoon Cat used to take the form of Cartoon Mouse, before the only entity more powerful than itself threatened litigation. This brings us to the entity of Cartoon Dog. While some believe that Cartoon Dog is a separate entity completely different from Cartoon Cat, others are convinced that they are the same creature, and that it just changes forms very often. Since their traits are all basically the same as far as I see it, the answer is very obviously that it doesn't fucking matter. If the majority of the population focuses on a new cartoon character, Cartoon Cat may take their form. And if it makes Cartoon AZFK, I'll see it the fucking court. Based on this info, it's likely that Cartoon Cat took its form around the 30s and looked quite different before the advent and popularization of animation. Trevor has gone so far as to say that these creatures understand morality and quite enjoy doing the most horrific of things they possibly can. So basically, it's like that kid that's edgy for edginess sake. Oh, you don't like that? I am the aberration, the absence of all. You wanna go, Bendy the Ink Machine's house cat? I'll have you fucking neutered. Oh wait, I don't even have to, because the quote unquote family friendly channels have already done that for me. Okay, ouch man. 
That one actually cut too deep and did unsavory things just to survive. I'm done participating in your terrible video. The country road creature is a vaguely humanoid shaped quadruped creature that walks high off the road using its long disproportionate arms. The entire body is emaciated, skin gripping tightly to the bone. There is not a single strand of hair stemming from its pale slender body. It has an extremity structure similar to a chimpanzee or ape, meaning that its toes are opposable and almost as dexterous as their fingers. In addition, all of these creatures' joints are a ball and socket joint, meaning that it can move any part of itself in any direction. It's able to move at staggering speeds in a series of unnatural manners. It can also seemingly climb any surface and contort itself through spaces much smaller than its own body. This creature's head looks like a bald old man with gleaming white pupilless eyes and razor sharp teeth. Now we can't even feel safe when we see a smiling naked old man in the middle of the forest at night. Is nothing sacred anymore? The country road creature frequents country roads. Idiot. It's an intriguing paranormal version of an ambush predator, disguising itself as a human by contorting its body to fit into items of clothing from its previous victims while obscuring its distended limbs. While some say it can shapeshift, it actually can just contort into a variety of forms. It is fully capable of overpowering a human on its own if the person is out in the middle of a backcountry road on foot, but in a car they move far too fast to catch up to and capture. From here, it has one of several strategies. It sometimes attempts to hitchhike, showing that it's either intelligent or can at least mimic behaviors that it has seen humans undertake. Other times, it will make its way to remote rest stops and wait in the shadows for someone to get gas, slipping underneath the car and holding on until the human pulls away, at which point it smashes open the window, attacking the human and causing a car wreck. It quickly consumes the victim and disappears back into the wilderness. Some have even speculated that this creature disguises itself as truck stop hookers in order to get the fattest of truckers to make sure it gets all its nutrients, and that someone who speculated it was me. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, I wouldn't get tricked by this. It would take some sort of dumb dumb idiot to get fooled by this goober. That confidence is usually what kills your species in the first place. Just saying. I'm willing to bet there are more people alive that think the earth is flat now than back then in the 3rd century BC. You're not getting smarter, there are just more of you. Foolish delicious human, wait what the f are you? Did you just pull a me on myself? You are, without a doubt the ugliest truck stop prostitute I have ever seen in my entire life. Yo, I gotta show you something while you're driving. Check out this sick disclaimer, dude. The God of Roadkill. The God of Roadkill is an entity that manifests either just before or shortly after animals are killed by a vehicle. Through an unknown method, this being causes humans to have car accidents, either to protect an animal from an oncoming vehicle or to avenge their death by flipping an inattentive motorist into the nearest ditch. This entity is theorized to be a spiritual one rather than a biological one. It's rumored to help the souls of dead animals cross over to the other side after their lives ended tragically and violently, subsequently assuming their physical form as a reward. Some researchers suspect that the god of roadkill is actually just some sort of freak engaging in necrophilia and bestiality at the same time. And by some researchers, I mean me. It has a human-like upper body that looks as if it's had its lower half severed just above the hips on the spine, almost as if it was cut in half by a car. Because of this, it moves around by using its disproportionately long arms to crawl. Reports of the creature have ranged in size from 20 to 35 feet tall. It has no skin only ragged and torn musculature with jagged bones piercing through. Its head looks like a vulture's except a much longer and distended beak and many human-like eyes placed seemingly at random about the skull. His form can vary depending on the severity of the creature's demise. If it was quick and painless, the entity usually has minimal flesh and stark white bleached bones. If the animal were to have a gruesome demise, the god of roadkill appears caked in dried blood, with organs trailing behind leaving a trail of blood and viscera as it drags itself along the road. This kind of messed up, but that actually made me kind of hungry. The creature looks, and especially smells, to be in a state of constant decay, although it never actually decays. Maggots, fungus, and other decomposers call this creature's rotting body home, making it a harbinger for various diseases. If a human makes contact with this creature after surviving the car crash, they are very likely to develop a fatal infection in the days to come. This infection mimics how dead matter decomposes to the letter. The only caveat is the person is alive to watch themselves fall apart. 
fault. While it is not fully understood how the god of roadkill causes these accidents, there are a few hints in the reports that help paint a picture. For starters, the cars always look as if they've been hit by something incredibly large and heavy, like a tree, but the patterns look more similar to an accident where the motor is struck flesh and bone rather than a plant. Human authorities know of few animals large enough for this, and the regions that have these unexplainable car wrecks can't really blame it on elephants. It's thought that the god of roadkill either manifests immediately in front of a car or leaps out in front of it at a great pace. It's like the classic movie scene where the friend jumps in front of a bullet for another friend, except the friends are the animal and the god of roadkill and your car is the bullet. Now some of you might consider the god of roadkill evil for murdering humans for a bunch of f squirrels, but from the god of roadkill's perspective, he just saw you murder a squirrel because you wanted to order chicken nuggets from the highway so you wouldn't have to wait 35 minutes when you got home. He's kind of got a better reason than you. Fun fact, there is a vertebrate animal run over by a car around every 11.5 seconds in the United States. What a waste of life, but more importantly, what a waste of food. In an attempt to avoid the god of roadkill opening up my nutsack at the seam with some other dingus's windshield, we're gonna go ahead and try to repurpose some of this meat that is left on the road every day. It is my hope that if we eat this rotting meat, we can lie to the horrific monsters that we as humans actually respect animals. I've heard from the reviews that the quality kind of varies. I mean, you kind of got to expect that. It's either venison or raccoon meat, so it's a mixed bag. Now, it's not that I think the average American is lacking food. To be honest, it's just the opposite. But you know, I think maybe a few tapeworms or intestinal parasites might be good for us. We're thinking outside the box. Okay, so here it is. Um, as you can see, the outside is noticeably more purple than most meat I am accustomed to. Also, it seems to be, um, you can see here, fairly torn up. Yeah, uh. Nothing tenderizes a good steak like busting the front axle on a Toyota Prius. If you're wondering what type of uh, meat this is, I can assure you that I am as well. I feel like ordinary sausage. Hey there, folks, welcome back. I wonder how you're supposed to cook this. Okay, so um, it says not to. So let's get into it. All right, so I think what we're gonna do is just get some salt. Some salt, yeah, because that's what, this is meat, I think. That's what you put on meat. Nice and salty. Oh wow, the backside is quite purple. I don't know what's wrong with me, man. I got this shit all in my hands. I gotta pour this all like that. Oh no, it's too much. Welcome to asthma with meat. This is concluded asthma with meat. Okay, um, I think the meat is salty enough. I don't know, man. I'm gonna wash my hands now and put it in, I guess, the oven. I don't even know what this sh Okay, 400 degrees, start. And into the oven it goes. <laughs> well, that's not a good sign. Yo, is my oven on fire? Oh no! We're just gonna ignore it. I'm gonna wait for the timer to be done. I'm gonna eat it. I'm gonna hope for all the problems to go away. Two things I don't uh, think things through and know where the oven mitts are. All right then. Let's, let's, uh, this is a bad idea. What the fuck? Oh! Ah! It's fine. We're just gonna grab the meat and then. Oh no, okay, pick it up. Yeah. Okay, so here's our weird meat. All right, so let's, let's see. Let's see about this. Let's cut it open. Interesting. All right, moment of truth. Mm hmm, not bad.
Who are you? Where am I? What is this place? Congratulations, sir. You've won a free safari tour of the back rooms and have been no clipped out of reality at no cost to yourself to claim your prize. That's cool and all, but I'm diabetic and need to get my insulin. This creature is known as Entity 116. Entity 116, aka the dentists, are humanoids made out of what looks like an amalgamation of exposed rotting flesh, teeth, jaw, and gum tissue. Basically, just imagine that your entire skin was made out of your mouth, and that's what we're dealing with. While this might sound morbid, just think of it as their entire body being a smile. Yeah, that doesn't help for me either, honestly makes it kind of worse. They leave a trail of slimy mucus secreted from their gum tissue, which causes a horrific fatal oral disease if touched. Dentists are reported to smell like the bodies that are not in my cellar. These creatures are incredibly hostile, following their prey, pinning them down, and stealing their teeth and gums while they're still conscious. These creatures are usually very slow, but be wary as they have a huge burst of speed when a prey item gets within pouncing distance. Next up are the Combine, a big old centipede made out of human parts. They usually have human hair running down the length of their body, but I shaved this one because it looks cute that way. Their legs look like double-bent human fingers tipped with chitinous photoreceptors to snuffle around their surroundings. The weird finger things can also vomit up digestive pouches for digestive purposes. Like many species, they can drop parts of their body when in danger and grow them back later. If you feel threatened, remember to rip off all of your own limbs. It's very distracting. They're scavengers that eat mold or decaying biological material, so they don't usually attack people. Keyword, usually. It's not opposed to going for someone if they're asleep, so just be wary of where you rest your head. How the hell does someone sleep in the back rooms? This entity is a strange combination of small mollusk-like creatures that all function as one unit. They give birth to young by shooting babies out of their legs. Like most methods of animal reproduction, this lands in the sweet spot between gross and beautiful. Some colonies of survivors in the back rooms have tamed these creatures like pets. I'm not allowed to go to Petco no more because the employee thought it was an innuendo when I kept asking for the finger centipede. Slightly more dangerous is the Smiler. The f are you looking at? The Smiler is a mysterious entity that stalks wanderers in the back rooms. They're often seen from a distance hiding in only the darkest areas, like a pervert. They stand out from the blackness with their glowing white eyes and radiant teeth bent into a wicked smile. They're attracted to light and will attempt to destroy any light source they come across. They're usually solitary hunters, but sometimes will travel in packs. As per their Tinder bio, their favorite method of dispatching a victim is via asphyxiation. Hey, yo, bitch, you like it rough? I choke out of the plastic rings on a sea turtle. Victims of a Smiler attack can be identified by swimming swelling or damage around the throat, deep nail impressions, and unhealthy romantic habits. If the person they are stalking makes it into a bright area, they will retreat into the distance and stalk the wanderer from that distance. Some have reported Smiler stalkings for as long as one human gestation period. They relish in torturing the wanderers they stalk, hence that stupid fucking grin plastered on its face. Most of their body remains hidden in the darkness, so we don't really know what these things look like other than the face. Some think it's a ghost, some think it's a snaky thing, some think it's just one giant limb for strangulation. You're not scary. It's actually pretty pathetic to pick on humans. I remember you from reform school, Jeremy. <laughs> These blob creatures are called bone thieves. They have toad-like bumpy yellow skin that's impervious to damage. They're mostly stationary creatures that hunt by replicating human noises and language to lure victims close enough to strike. It's theorized that they're able to recreate almost any voice using an extremely developed larynx and vocal cords. No one knows how people become boneless when they get near the bone thieves, but they know it's an extremely fast and pretty clean process, because they end up looking like a plastic CVS bag made out of human skin. No hole, no blood, no nothing but a body puddle. They're there are only two entities powerful enough to be capable of this mysterious trickery. Their mouths open extremely wide to reveal a set of eyes in their throats. They have two holes on the sides of their head where normal eyes would be, but those just leak some strange blue fluid that coats their entire body. There's no gums or teeth inside the gullet, just an empty black soulless void in that set of beady little eyes. After all the victim's bones are gone, the bone thieves distend their jaws and swallow the boneless human nugget whole, and then don't eat for a while. In a similar vein to the Bone Thieves are the Skin Stealers. Skin Stealers are entities that feed on human skin and flesh. It wears the skins of its past victims as a disguise. It's also capable of mimicking human speech, but it's not capable of understanding it. This thing has clear blood, so if you're not sure if it's a Skin Stealer or a person, stab it. If it bleeds clear and sprints away, it's a Skin Stealer. If it bleeds red, hysterically screams, cries, and stops moving, it's probably a human. Skin Stealers have huge white sunken eyes. When the Skin Stealer murderlates a victim, it wears the skin for a 
about a day. After a period of around 24 hours, the skin will be digested through the surface of the skin stealer's real skin, and the skin stealer will enter a docile state cause it's no longer hangry. Hey, you look like that guy from earlier. Has no one checked if I'm just really drunk and looking for the bathroom? This is the stalker. Stalkers target lonely wanderers in the back rooms. They're masterful at disguising their bodies and voices to look like that of loved ones, friends, or other survivors, similar to the skills of their digital cousin, the catfisher. The longer you have gone without human contact, the more susceptible you are to a stalker's illusions and manipulations. A stalker's true form is a tall, sinewy, skeletal humanoid with tightly wrapped white leathery skin and two giant red eyes. It has long floppy fingers and toes that end in claws. Its mere presence induces nostalgia in dreams of the person's life before the back rooms. They like to season the meat of their human victims with betrayal, by acting as a loved one before striking to gain the trust of their prey. They will betray you in whatever manner makes you feel the worst based on what they've learned about you personally during the time that you thought you knew them. While this sounds bad, I know humans who operate the exact same way. They've been reported to work together and coordinate to break down an entire society of survivors. To feed, it uses a massive proboscis which comes out of its face to inject digestive enzymes into the human body. It takes a few days to digest the victim, so it'll hide it in the closet until its internal organs have putrefied into a black sludge so it can slurp it out of your now juice box of a body. This liquid entity is not water. Well, it's not not water. Well, it, it is not water, but it's more than just not water. It's a sentient self-aware liquid with an extensive knowledge of the back rooms. Drinking the not water connects you to the entity's consciousness, as well as connecting you psychically to everyone who has drank the not water. This is both useful and dangerous because it gives you useful information, but it also drives you 100% but insane. To demonstrate, we have an ethically sourced human test subject right here. I just peed on this COVID test. I'm definitely pregnant. I wonder if anyone has ever been murdered with the binging with Radish Branch Chef. Man. You shouldn't have the thighs of a pregnant 15 year old. I subsist solely on bugs that I scrounge up from the ground. <laughs> If you end up drinking it, the entity will communicate with you, but you might not be able to hear it clearly over the shrieking voice of everyone else who drank it. This entity can control your mind, but usually it doesn't bother with anything like that. A good way to fix a not water afflicted brain is by removing it. This liquid is pee, and it is mine. A less threatening and actually helpful backrooms liquid is almond water. Almond water is the main source of hydration and survival in the backrooms. It can be found in bottles, cartons, cans, flowing through some of the pipes into water fountains on certain levels, even those weird squishy toys, you know the ones. The ones that have that hole that runs through the middle. What are those called again? A jellyfish snake wiggler. It is literally in the name. That is not just me. I'm not the perverted one, you're the perverted one. You give flashlights to your children. There's rarely any label or indication that it's almond water, so you gotta figure that out on your own. This liquid can be identified by a vanilla rose smell, which is important because there's other stuff that you can drink that'll just kill you or worse. Go by the rhyme. If it's vanilla and rose, trust your nose. If it's any other other smell, prepare yourself for hell. It's reported to taste like a sweet vanilla mint rose water. I don't know why the fuck they call it almond water. Almond water can be used as a curative for many diseases native to the back rooms. For example, it can prevent human beings from turning into a wretch. Humans can turn into a wretch when they succumb to a lack of food, water, and sleep and become vulnerable to the poorly understood wretch cycle. Wretches are completely insane zombie-like creatures that have inhuman strength and hunt humans in packs using rudimentary handmade weapons. If you don't want to become one of these, drink your goddamn almond water. Moving on to a slightly less moist but much more dangerous topic, this is carpet moss. I mean, you can't see it, but trust me, it's there. It's located on level zero and looks almost indistinguishable to the damp carpet that covers the floor of the level, except for a thin layer of clear gelatinous adhesive slime on its surface. Carpet moss is an entity that behaves similarly to a carnivorous plant. It remains dormant, seeping moisture from the carpet until a wanderer stumbles onto it. Acting like an extremely sticky glue trap, it usually adheres to the feet of the wanderer first, who is then stuck on the carpet moss. The moss then releases what are theorized to be psychoactive spores into the air. When inhaled, it causes intense fear and disorientation, usually causing the wanderer to scramble and lose their balance, falling onto the carpet moss, sealing their fate. Strangely, when the victim has the entirety of its body stuck to the surface, the moss will exude another unknown psychoactive to calm the victim. And some survivors who escape this report intense euphoria and even an aphrodisiac state. This can be so powerful that some survivors sprint back onto the moss and attack anyone who tries to take them away. The carpet moss will then release a powerful digestive enzyme that dissolves everything except the bones of the victim. A telltale sign that a room in level zero has a carpet moss infestation is that there are large scattered collections of mucus-latent bones. Who would have guessed that having a bunch of complete human skeletons
skeletons on the floor would be considered a red flag. Nah, I'm just kidding. I made the carpet moss up completely, but I had you though, didn't I? Today's backrooms mania induced psychotic episode is on level fun. Level fun is similar to that of level zero with its damp piss yellow carpets and walls, but it has some key differences. Level fun basically looks like one of those laser tag birthday celebration rooms, but if you took the uncanny valley factor and dialed it up to 11. You know, plastic chairs, table in the middle, creepy off-brand wall decals, cake that some kid has obviously just been shoving into his mouth with his bare hands that just also happens to be made out of human flesh, the whole nine yards. Wandering around this smells almost as weird as Chuck E. Cheese's party room level are the party goers. Party goers are intelligent and aggressive humanoid creatures that used to be human. They are tall, sinewy, with long, smooth, yellowish, leathery skin. In place of an eyes and mouth, they have bloodied empty sockets and crudely carved smiles, but they can still somehow see and vocalize. They use balloons as distractions and almond water as bait, so if something is weird, that's probably a good indication that it's weird. They can be outrun fairly easily because they can sprint for more than 20 seconds. Actually, I'm not sure if everybody watching this video can sprint for longer than 20 seconds, so who knows, maybe you'll be okay. You'll know if you're spotted because you'll begin to hear a distorted nursery rhyme. The song is actually a cognito hazard and results in whoever hearing it becoming extremely tired and numb to everything. So basically, it won't affect most of us in the slightest. The party goers are skilled at no clipping themselves or others, so you often don't even know if you've changed levels into their domain. Party goers use strategy in hunting, where some will chase from behind as the others barricade off exits with the furniture and wait around corners of doorways to ambush prey. The ends of the party goers' arms have holes that contain retractable fish hook like claws that they use to latch onto their prey. After breaking the skin, the party goer transfers a venom to the victim and then retreats like a pussy. The process will first take place in the affected area. You can cure this in the early stages via amputation or using super almond water. If you're wondering what super almond water is, it's the result of intense oversaturation and that kid that always has to top your story with a better made up story. The skin will begin to become leathery around the marks and spread across the surface of the skin. Blood flow to the hands will stop and they will go numb, turn purple, and fall off. The radius and ulna bones will dissolve and fuse in an incredibly painful process, rendering both arms immobile temporarily. Over the next few days, the victim will develop what looks like bruises that quickly turn into pustules. These will soon pop when the hooks have grown enough from the newly formed compound bone to pierce the surface, revealing a sore-like hole that the hooks can retract into. The victim's hair and face will seemingly begin to melt away like a plastic CVS bag that I left in my friend's oven. The venom degrades any memory of the victim's past life. They basically go full batch at this point and carve eyes and a mouth and begin receiving telepathic communications from the party host that the infector party goer belonged to. Party hosts are weird fat man baby fetus creatures with a party hat crudely stapled onto their scalp. They're completely immobile with shriveled human eyes and they're often sitting at a table with a human flesh cake with a candle in it. Because of their defenselessness physically, they're often guarded by party goers. Oh yeah, they telepathically communicate with the party goers and can see through their eyes. Happy birthday, little guy. Thanks for inviting me. I got you a gift. <laughs> Today's fever dream of a backrooms cartoon is about level relativity. This level has the same pea-stained carpeting and walls as level zero, but because of the additional anomalous properties, it can hardly be called similar. Level relativity, also known as level 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 level, is a series of stairs and hallways arranged in a seemingly impossible structure that resembles the painting Relativity by M.C. Escher. The laws of nature do not apply on this level the same way it does in your dimension. Here, everything is relative including gravity. Each stairway can be used by wanderers who belong to two different gravity sources. This creates interesting phenomena, such as in the top stairway, where two inhabitants use the same stairway in the same direction on the same side, but each using a different face of each step. Thus, one descends the stairway as the other climbs it, even while moving in the same direction, nearly side by side. In other stairways, wanderers are climbing the stairs upside down, but based on their own gravity source, they are climbing normally. If you jump high enough, you can actually change change gravity fields and fall down onto other stairs. While this is dangerous and has resulted in a lot of unconventional neck bone orientations for idiots, it can be used strategically to get to some previously inaccessible areas on this level and to escape some of the less physically capable entities. Each field seems to affect more than just gravity, as there have been reported distortions in things such as visual perspective, 
time, and sexual preferences. If two wanderers in two planes with significantly different timescales are looking at one another, one would appear to be moving as if they were in a time lapse, and vice versa, they'd look like they were in slow motion. Level relativity is home to several entities, one of which being memory worms. Memory worms live on multiple different levels. They're massive bloated wiggly worms with large teeth that spiral down the length of their entire body. These worms have mind-boggling metaphysical abilities. They hunt based on creating illusions relative to the victim's memories. If you see a big slimy worm and then your reality suddenly dissolves and you're watching your old favorite TV show for the first time in your old house getting nostalgic oral from your ex, <clears throat> thanks. They eat their prey whole, digest it partially, and then give birth to a ton of little wormlings made out of the remains. Like most methods of reproduction, what you would consider gross, this species considers so arousing they'd just pay someone to watch. These wormlings can be smashed up and boiled with almond water to create memory juice. Be careful when collecting these creatures, as too many wormling bites can lead to amnesia and even a vegetative state. Memory juice just gets you high as balls. Maybe it has something to do with your memory. I don't fucking remember. People say it helps you accept your situation in the back rooms and reduce your stress. I know lots of people who do this. You don't have to live in the back rooms to need to drink something to get high as balls to accept your situation. It's just called alcoholism. Wanderers report that it's not addictive and they can stop anytime they want, but also don't check the wiki. An entity that can only be found in level relativity are the staircase mollusks. They may be hard to see at first as they are camouflaged amongst the mucus colored walls and floors. They have thick shells that resemble the wallpaper and a muscular foot like a snail that has a slimy texture similar to the damp semen crusted carpet. They can flatten out against a wall to disguise themselves and then pop into the air like those weird pop things that iDub made a giant one of that you can get as a reward for not biting the dentists more than three times. They can stick to any surface and are incredibly skilled at navigating gravity fields while hunting. They often launch full speed at a wanderer, switching gravity fields in the middle, subsequently accelerating their attack, shattering the wanderer's bones on impact with their thick chitinous shell. Afterwards, the mollusk will sit on top of the victim, its muscular foot oozing a digestive enzyme for a few hours before leaving behind only a spooky skeleton. Mm. Oh yeah, by the way, I made this whole fucking level up because the back rooms has like three cannons at this point. And I was like, fuck it, let's make it four. I mean like memory worms and the worm juice are actually real. They're from the wiki and I plagiarized a little part of this from MC Escher's relativity Wikipedia page but the rest, I was just pulling stuff out of my ass. I had you though, didn't I? What would you do if your friend snorted what you thought was a regular old fleshipede and then wouldn't shut up about how you should really change your lifestyle and fill your kidney with insect eggs? This guy looks like he's struggling. Maybe we should give him a hand, huh? And what do you mean I shouldn't empty my entire bank account to throw this tropical telepathic bird a blow and blow party? These are neural isopods, arthropod-like creatures that resemble large jungle centipedes. Instead of a chitinous interior, it has a soft, fleshy, slime-covered exterior to help it slide through tight spaces. They wait in the crevices of the back rooms and latch onto the lower leg of a wanderer before climbing up and attempting to enter the body through an orifice. They prefer to enter the body through the nose, ears, or mouth as it is closer to the brain and it's more easily accessible. Although, they have been reported to go in the anuses, urethras, eat through eyes, flesh, or bone to get to the brain. The neural isopod uses electric stimulation in order to manipulate the host's neurons, controlling its thought and movement. It brings its host to a nest where a swarm of neural isopods lay eggs inside the body, and in a few days, the eggs will hatch and the victim will be slowly eaten alive as a living nursery to grow the babies. They grow up so fast. An adult neural isopod can control you to believe that you are in full control of your actions while it's puppeteering you, and you will willingly go to the nest. On the other end of the spectrum, juvenile neural isopods are only adept enough to roughly control the physical movements of the human body, so they basically make you walk like a stroke victim drunk Frankenstein towards your death while you completely are aware and terrified as to what is happening. While this is reversible, it takes more than just some almond water to do it. In fact, the creature will just drink the almond water from the victim's bloodstream, making the parasite stronger. You need to fully remove this isopod to the brain, and oftentimes attempts in this just
must end in full accidental lobotomy. We got one out of Swampus' set here, and I'm glad he's still alive, but he hasn't been quite the same. I wanna go to the fair! Blimps are nightmarish, pulsating, slithery, formless mounds of arms, legs, and other appendages. Oh god, I'm gonna come- They move by using their haphazardly positioned legs to drag their writhing, fat, grub-like mass across the moist, carpeted floor. While they move slowly when a wanderer is not in sight, this can be dangerously misleading, as they can accelerate to over 20 miles per hour in the blink of an eye. When they see a wanderer, they barrel full speed towards them before extending a long hidden arm that can accost a prey at them from over 20 feet away. It will then pull the victim into the massive limbs where they undergo a gruesome excruciating amalgamation process. Which really isn't that bad at all. This is a rabbit. Hot Topic Cyclops cousin of raving rabbits typically grow to the size of an adult man. This is not the maximum, however, because like some species of reptile, the only growth limit they have is what their nutrition can support. With lots of fresh wanderers, this boy can grow big and strong to almost 16 feet or 5 meters tall. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Rabbits have three legs and a single body structured like a tripod. They have jagged, bumpy exoskeletons looking similar to rotted wood. Their eyes are designed by Neuralink and are able to shine a light into the darkness to help them see. Their mouth has a human-like jaw, but all the teeth inside are sharp canines. Their exoskeletons are made of a two-inch thick crystalline structure that is much more durable than a regular exoskeletal chitin. This effectively makes the rabbit bulletproof, fire resistant, good at active listening, basically this thing is a cockroach, it doesn't matter if you have a nuke. These creatures are incredibly aggressive, mauling survivors and fully eating them in a matter of minutes, not even leaving a bone behind. This is Jerry. Jerry is what I live for. Jerry is everything. Jerry is love. Jerry is life. Jerry is a small bird that looks suspiciously similar to a parrot. It can control the mind of the person holding it, making it say things like Jerry is everything. All hail Jerry. I'm not gay, but I'd let Jerry peg me. Those controlled by Jerry eventually go missing shortly afterwards, with the parrot eventually reappearing on a seemingly random level to find a new host. Giving Jerry sunflower seeds or almond water will tame Jerry, allowing you to pick him up safely. This will only work with the person who fed Jerry, and anyone else who holds Jerry will be affected normally. With this knowledge, you can weaponize Jerry and use him to your advantage by basically creating a missing person bird trap to get rid of anybody you hate. Let's play a game, huh? One of these I made up on my own, and the other three are from the fandom page. Leave a comment which one you thought I made up below. If you get it right, I'll let you live. Some of you have to be expecting that I'm lying to you at this point. I'll staple a dead snake to your forehead. Today's fever dream of a Backrooms cartoon is about the Shady Grey. The Shady Grey, spelled like an emo kid's online alias, is a collection of incredibly unstable sublevels that are all in black and white and affected by a unique glitching distortion effect. There are five documented levels in this collection. There are three more, but no one knows what happens to the documents or the wanderers that recorded it. The first sublevel is level 00. This level is a jungle affected by the glitchy black and white phenomena that affects all shady gray levels. The trees glitch within one another and all animals appear distorted. Touching these distorted things will lead to death by full body distortion and organ evisceration, but on the bright side, this level has a bestiality fatality rate of 100%. The level has a 12 hour day night cycle, however it is extremely different from the normal 24 hour cycle within the front rooms. Instead of the sun slowly moving across the sky and then crossing the horizon, the sky instantly changes from day to night or vice versa without any warning. During the day there are no entities, but at night they become as numerous as the colonies of bacteria in the swamp ass accumulating in your taint as you watch this. The entities in question are unknown due to the night state of level zero being completely devoid of any light. The only confirmed entity in this section are the howlers because people only know what they sound like and no one knows what the hell they look like. Every time the clock hits 12, it shifts from day to night. To proceed to the next level, all you gotta do is take a branch and draw a pentagram into the mud for some reason. I don't know, dude. I mean, that's what the wiki says. Actually, no, I don't like that. There's no reason to include satanic in influence in the back rooms. It's a hat on top of the additional nine hats it's already wearing. You just, you just no clip out. What do you mean this isn't the bathrooms? Level 1-1 is an extremely unstable, old-timey manor. Much of the furniture is glitchy and distorted, and again, touching it results in full body distortion and organ evisceration. There is one entity on this level known as the Landlord, who looks like a tall, slender man from the 50s in a fedora and business suit, except he has the same glitching as the furniture in the level. Actually, no fuck it, he's just 
literally Slenderman. If he sees you, he will approach you slowly. Attempting to run will result in all doors closing and locking before you can exit. The landlord will continue to approach, claiming you are trespassing to watch him on the toilet. Contact with the landlord results in death in the same fashion as when one touches the furniture. Humans usually either perish when he gets to them or break down one of the doors leading to level 2-2. Two -two. Level 2-2 two -two is a large, thick forest covered in snow. Despite being covered in snow, this level is actually incredibly hot, so much so that wanderers often die of heat stroke or heat syncope. I don't feel so good. Because everything in this level is tinted black and white, sunburns are very hard to see forming, and people often get severe blisters in a matter of minutes if not in the shade. There is one type of rarely seen entity on this level known as the Fallen Angels. They are humanoids with large black wings and horns. They all look to be fatally injured and will mostly just ignore wanderers, but if provoked they will clip wanderers into level 3-3. Three -three. If you for some reason want to provoke them, simply point out how cliche their entire design is and they'll get super defensive and immediately resort to violence. Level 3-3 three -three is an infinite ocean filled with anomalous time-altering cocks. Clocks. The ocean consists of an incredibly toxic mix of distilled water, mercury, and motor oil. There are three different types of clocks floating on the surface of this ocean. Analog clocks, digital clocks, and grandfather clocks, each with unique anomalous properties. Analog clocks will clip you into level 4-4. Four -four. Digital clocks will freeze someone in time, usually resulting in them just drowning. And grandfather clocks either age the person into an incredibly elderly person or a fetus, which usually also just results in drowning. There are boats on this level filled with faceless, fat, sunburned tourist guys in grayed out Hawaiian shirts and islands on this level as well, all seemingly having the same blistering weather conditions as level 2-2. Level 4-4 is an expansive gothic city where the glitching of the shady gray becomes incredibly severe. Some buildings are upside down, some are clipped inside of each other, some are floating. All the buildings are locked, but like the skull of those who are unsubscribed, they can easily be busted into. This is basically asking for death though, as the buildings are infested with smilers, skin stealers, and a hostile entity known as the Mangled. The Mangled are skinless human heads that move with a series of spider-like limbs constructed from human bones and muscle tissue. The ends of their limbs are incredibly sharp, and they dig the nubbins into the surface to allow them to climb amongst the skyscrapers. Put your guess as to whether or not they're friendly in the comments below. That's not how the wiki describes them. The streets aren't much better, as you'll probably end up curb stomped and robbed by the violent gangs of faceless people that roam the alleys. The entire level is overcast by the thick gray clouds, making it extremely dark. This makes the level doubly dangerous if you have seasonal affective disorder, aka the depressive disorder that some pessimists named Sad. No clipping here brings you to the last documented level of the Shady Grey, Lost Hope. Lost Hope is the level with the edge lordiest name. Sounds like a goddamn XXX Tentacion wannabe. This is when the stability of the Shady Grey completely disappears. This level resembles the concrete pipe-filled maintenance hallways of level 2, except the walls are distorted and wobbling with great intensity. This level is almost entirely undocumented as anyone who touches a surface here has their body ripped apart at the atomic level. The strong friendship bonds keeping their atoms together slowly breaking apart until their entire body is reduced to nothing but floating particles. This process resembles intense radiation damage, except I'm gonna say that it's worse because for spooky. <laughs> Bursters are small, vaguely humanoid, quadruped-like creatures that scurry around the halls of the back rooms. I like to call them pimple chimps. Their back legs are distended to look more similar to a canine than that of a human crawling. The burster's skin is covered in lesions and pustules that are filled to the brim and leaking with acidic fluid. These creatures will stay in the fetal position until another living being happens across them, at which point they will pop their weird, gross back pimples all over the victim, spraying their entire body with incredibly potent acid, dissolving them in a matter of minutes to hours. The burster will wait for the victim to succumb to their wounds out of laziness before consuming them. They can also damage themselves with the acid. And like that guy who drowned in his own cum, many of the bursters succumb to their own fluids. Surgeons appear to be a door in a wall that is indistinguishable from the rest of the surroundings unless you are on the arm side. Oh yeah, there's like a buttload of arms on one side. These arms will lie dormant until a wanderer, animal, or other entity passes through the doorway. The arms will then spring to life and restrain the wanderer by their wrists, ankles, and neck 
neck before slicing off the extremities and sometimes the head of the victim with their scalpel-like professionally done acrylic nails. The arms will then skillfully rearrange and sew the victim Frankenstein reanimator style back together in a new strange form. Occasionally, the surgeon will add additional body parts from a slit in the fleshy door frame, which I like to call the extremity hole. It's theorized that this extremitory repository is filled with pieces of former victims left over. In some scenarios, surgeons will combine wanderers with animals or entity parts, forming an entirely new abomination. They are very creative. The victim will somehow always survive, maintaining locomotion abilities in all of their limbs, including any new additional ones. While locomotion is technically possible, it results in extreme agony for the first several days after bodily reconstruction. The surgeon transforms the victim into one of a variety of forms, sometimes quadrupedal, sometimes just a leg and a head, sometimes they shuffle the functions of every hole in your face. Pretty random. Nah, I'm just kidding, I made this up because I'm obsessed with the movie Tusk and people did not vote for me to cover it. I had you though, didn't I? Crawlers are the collective name for all those affected by an anomalous species of fungus native to the back rooms. This fungus is visually similar to something I'm not gonna try to pronounce and just put it on screen. A strain of cordyceps fungi which zombifies insects, and currently has a lawsuit levied against it by the Last of Us development team. This fungus growth is extremely aggressive and the infection is present in abundance on many levels. The crawler fungus can only spread to humans through liquids such as saliva, although it can spread to animals and insects via contact. It thrives in warm, dark, damp places like backrooms, carpets, or that weird space between your crotch and your thigh. This infection will progress, with the mold covering more and more of the organism until it's completely engulfed in it. As the infection progresses, the entity will become more and more aggressive and attempt to spread the infection through biting. In the final stages of infection, victims will have every bodily fluid in their system saturated with spores. And before you weirdos ask, yes, that fluid too, and this does technically mean that it is an STD. Ever hear of the numbed man? The numbed man knows as much about you as you do about it. If you learn his weaknesses, he learns yours. If you learn his strengths, he learns yours. If you learn what he jerks off to, the numbed man is a weak humanoid entity who can only be sensed by those he senses. For this reason, he has destroyed his own senses. He tore out his eyes in order to blind himself. He mangled his nose so that he couldn't smell. He punctured his eardrums to become deaf. He burned off his skin so that he could no longer feel touch. I mean, I, I guess that's pretty metal. He has no way to sense anyone nearby, and thus they cannot sense him either. This keeps him safe. The numbed man is not bound by any floor or physical barriers. But again, you basically have to overpower a confused, disoriented, senseless, old blind man. Only thing is he floats and can walk through walls. See, I learned about him before you did, so he's gotta go through me to get to you. Floating and phasing through objects isn't really considered a power in my species. You actually get special parking if you can't do it. Last time I fought a blind and deaf man, I won. It wasn't even a competition. I absolutely fucking obliterated him. Two for two. Hounds are another quadruped humanoid-like creature with warped and distended limbs to make this style of locomotion more easy. These creatures hatch from goopy weird frog eggs. They have long tangled greasy black basement dweller hair growing from their head and an extremely large mouth latent with sharp teeth. Oh yeah, also claws to match cause they know how to coordinate an outfit. Despite looking like an anorexic, bedridden, dying old man, they are quite powerful and quick. They'll pretty much maul anything that isn't, or sometimes is, another hound on sight until the resulting small red pile either stops moving and or existing. Although, if you just stare these things directly in the eye, their brain kind of shuts down. See, my whole head is an eye, so as long as I'm just like generally facing them, they're gone. There's nothing behind these eyes. Not a single thought. Head empty. Death moths are giant edgy emo moths that inhabit the back rooms. Male death moths are small, kinda dumb, and sometimes even friendly. He a good boy. You're my friend now. Female hot topic butterflies are several feet in wingspan, can spit acid at great speeds, and will attempt to turn anything that moves into a pile of sputtering mush. Like anglerfish, this species is big on that horror movie type femdom stuff. Not much is known about the goth moth other than it looks pretty similar to a normal moth and it kills 
people who try to study it. Like regular moths, edgy moths are attracted to light. While this is bad if you hear fluttering of wings nearby and you have a flashlight, you could also just put a torch in front of a wood chipper and solve all your problems. Next up is something designed to be completely unpronounceable, obviously based on HP Lovecraft type spelling. I'm just gonna call it an arachnid, cause that's the closest reference creature y'all have. This back room's arachnid is a large spider-like arthropod with 16 legs. While these beings certainly aren't benign, they are slow moving and haven't been observed actively pursuing prey items. As long as you don't stand directly under it like the back room's equivalent of a dodo bird that humans tend to be, you'll probably be fine. Speaking of, these entities generally stay hidden on the ceiling, creating ball-shaped webs and filling them with sedative secretions that while unable to completely paralyze a victim, is enough to greatly dampen a person's thinking capability. It then hangs these balls on the ceiling with additional webbing. It continues to do this until there is prey nearby, at which point it will drop a ball. The effect of the depressant starts and the victim will start to feel drowsy, happy, and confused like they faced a blunt. It then proceeds to drop all of the balls at once, making the target completely unresponsive to any outside stimuli, like a guy passed out in his own vomit. The spider boy then drops down to its prey and proceeds to inject digestive enzymes into the victim before slurping out the resulting slurry. After feeding, it returns to the ceiling and hibernates before setting up its traps once again. Its secretion can be refined into painkillers and other useful drugs. But in the pure state, it induces a psychoactive state that some describe as a psychedelic opiate effect. It can be eaten, refined and smoked, even boofed. I dissolved some of it into a vape juice and got it into a concert once. Next up is the cerebrospinal leech. Like most leeches, the cerebrospinal leech is a blood-sucking parasite. But what else does it suck? Cerebrospinal fluid. It's in the name. Are you stupid? Sometimes I think you just watch these videos because you can't read. Latching on lower points of the spine for a few hours can lead to paralysis below where the leech is latched on. But if left for long enough, it can lead to complete paralysis and death by paralyzing the respiratory system. Despite their pleas to end the pain, we have managed to keep a victim in this state alive on a respirator. Latching directly onto the brain is often lethal in a matter of minutes, as the leech will drain the skull of cerebrospinal fluid ravenously, leaving the victim's brain like a wrung out sponge. As this happens, the victim's cognitive function will decline rapidly before they just seize up and fall over dead. Sometimes the leech will suck with such force that the skull makes sickening crunches as it crumples up like an empty Capri Sun bag. A lot of people have been asking if we're from the back rooms, or if they can try to put us on the fandom or the wiki. I I have two things to say to that. One, I'm not from the back rooms. I just like hanging out here, it's a vibe. Two, I'll say it once, I've said it a million times. I'm not an SCP, I'm not a creepypasta, I'm not a backrooms entity, I just like to pick on them. Why is everyone asking who I am? You shouldn't ask questions that you really don't want the answer to. So how about you just sit back, let your guard down, and enjoy some cartoons, huh? These entities are known as the putrid. They look like a decaying, bloated corpse of a morbidly obese human. The literal embodiment of decay and depravity. Mushrooms, mold, colonies of decomposer bacteria, and insect infestations are very common on the surface of their skin. Their smell is reported to be somewhere in between dead camel and living discord mod. The entirety of this entity's distended gut and body is filled with a coiled and twisted mass of intestines. When this entity opens its mouth, you can see the tip of this pile of intestines resting at the back of its cavernous throat. These intestines are filled with rats, maggots, flies, beetles, and various other decomposer friends that are common in front rooms environments. If you think this is gross, I'd like to remind you that you are constantly covered in microscopic bugs. Don't like it? Too bad, you die without them. If a putrid spots a wanderer, it will frantically wobble its large, uncoordinated mass towards them. It can vomit up some of these decomposers to attempt to subdue the victim. If it can incapacitate or catch up to the wanderer, the putrid will then swallow follow them whole, where the ecosystem of decomposers inside of its body act like a digestive system, breaking the victim down for nutrients before spreading it throughout the putrid's body. While most of you were likely horrified by the previous description, I'd be willing to bet one of you sickos is confused and ashamed as to why that turned them on. This entity is named Six Arms, and it's attracted to stress. We are painfully well acquainted. Six Arms is a partially transparent creature which manifests as a tall, many-armed shadow. It has more than six arms, but since 
six is as high as the person who discovered this entity can count. That's the name. It is vaguely humanoid and emits distorted noises similar to that of a gas-powered machine. It has been observed moving through walls effortlessly, which may imply it is entirely non-corporeal. The more stressed a wanderer becomes, the more likely six arms will be to pursue them. It's recommended you calm down if you notice a darkening of your environment, which signifies his presence. Because he is pursuing you, calming down may be difficult. It's like how you gotta make yourself big to scare off bears. Like, that is not what I'd expect to work. Honestly, that sounds like the stupidest fucking thing you could possibly do. But everyone who doesn't do that is dead, so... Yeah. Sugar is also effective at repelling it. While this is a useful survival strategy, it's pretty mean to pick on someone for having diabetes. I don't think that's gonna age well. This meat is gummy. That's the title. These are worms that look to be an assortment of regular gummy worms. They crawl around on the ground in a fashion similar to a regular earthworm. After a brief moment of wondering if I wanted to eat a gummy worm I found on top of a dirty wet carpet, that obvious yes led me to discover that these creatures are edible. Not only that, they're pretty damn good. The uncooked ones have a texture and taste similar to raw beef, and the cooked ones taste like a steak. I like them both ways, but unlike the time my human friend and I had a raw beef eating contest, Test and she demonstrated her regurgitation based ranged attack, eating them raw is safe for humans. Despite moving like a regular worm, when dissected they have no internal organs, just more of that gummy stuff that has a consistency similar to animal fat. These creatures come from giant glob clusters of around 200 worms that burst and spread around. People ask why I keep coming back to the back rooms, lots of people think it's just for the money and clout, and while you're not wrong, the real reason I love the back rooms is that there's no police to stop me. Wall worms are worms residing in the walls of the back rooms that can grow up to 30 feet in length. These worms resemble, but do not taste like, the common earthworm. They move in an unnatural, seemingly robotic pulsating rhythm. Someone please sample it and make me a wall worm type beat. Wall worms vary wildly in size, with possibly only the environment limiting how big they can get. Worms in level 0 and similar levels will be around 2 feet long, whereas levels with large uninterrupted sections of land can have wall worms as long as 20 feet in length. With unconfirmed reports of worms growing to be around the size of a few city blocks. Wall worms contain robotic cores in their interior which serve to animate them. These robotic engines differ from worm to worm and are usually in a rusty state of disrepair despite remaining functional. So no, unless you want tetanus in your vagetinus, you cannot stick these cores inside of there. Some wall worms have been described as a layer of skin, approximately one lambskin condom thick, stretched out around a cylindrical mass of electrical wires that extend from their core, while others have a small core buried deep within an extensive and otherwise natural mass of flesh. To date, no wall worm in captivity or otherwise has been observed to die of natural causes, but they can be killed easily by destroying this inner core. Aside from providing these electrical impulses that allow the wall worms to move, these corroded engines will also produce a corrosive, viscous slime of unknown chemical composition that allows wall worms to eat through almost anything. This residue displays highly acidic properties and is highly flammable, threatening to make entire colonies and outpost infrastructures unstable if a wall worm infestation is not dealt with immediately. Backroom's life hack, you can milk these worms and collect their acidic secretions in glass almond water containers. After you recover from milking your worm, plop a napkin in the top and light it on fire. Essentially, you have an acid bomb and a Molotov cocktail all in one. If the flesh of the wall worm is damaged or removed, it will be fully regenerated within a period of two days by a chemical reaction that causes a wall worm's acidic slime to congeal and coalesce into new layers of skin. If you're desperate enough, you can carve out small sections of this worm and cook them for food since they'll grow back, and you can basically use this creature like a living flesh farm. This is the Game Master. This entity is the only entity that inhabits level 389, aka the Gaming Hall. She resembles a human-sized doll with a jester hat and a dress, has stitched X's for eyes, appears to be suspended like a puppet, and because this is my video and you're obviously gonna make me do another Backroom Smasher Pass episode, I'm gonna make her bad as hell. Seriously, human, stop trying to make me fuck the Harley Quinn puppet. It's not funny, it's gonna get us both in trouble. This entity just likes to chill and play games. When playing a game with a survivor trapped inside level 389, the Game Master will always attempt to cheat without the player knowing. However, if called out on her breaking the rules, she will instantly be forced to stop. 
This same rule applies to the player. It is still unclear what actually happens when a game is lost. Her personality could be described as chaotic and unpredictable, where she will move around in gravity-defying mannerisms as well as her hands having the appearance of being tugged on slash around. She will typically be found tinkering with the game she creates and edits, or laying down on the ground like a rag doll. Pretty relatable, most of my day is spent doing one of those two things too. The Game Master will often go several hours or even days completely limp. While the Game Master exhibits control over the entire level, she cannot leave and claims to be trapped inside. It is assumed that she is a puppet in the literal sense, and something unknown to us is currently in control of her physical body. Alright, this is getting more and more sus by the moment, and that's exactly what I was worried about. The Game Master seems to have powerful telekinetic and reality-altering abilities, being able to create games that break the laws of physics and edit these games without making physical contact. In addition, Level 389 itself seems to move and change its layout to her will. Fortunately, she does not use these powers to harm survivors on this level, except a little bit in the fun way. Any photos taken of the Game Master will inexplicably show up as blank. Well, to you it's inexplicable because you don't have interdimensional internet and you haven't seen her post about content theft from her OnlyFans. Scorpses are scorpion-like creatures that like to remove heads from dead bodies and talk using their voices. Well, that's a pretty neat party trick, they can do a lot more than just your average talented puppeteer that just happens to use decapitated human heads. They can psychically project the deceased's memories. If they cannot find a pre-cut head to communicate with, they will use their club-like tails to bludgeon wanderers to death and use their heads for communication. They measure on average 10 feet or 3 meters long and weigh around 200 pounds. When they have a human head to speak through, they are about as intelligent as a regular human being. But without it, they are about as dumb as a regular scorpion. Once in possession of a human skull, scorpses are able to project mental images into the minds of anybody within a 50 feet radius. These images will be composed from memories belonging to the decapitated head, but are used by the scorpses to communicate through a vaguely understood pictographic language. The Scorpses will torture their victims with disturbing memories such as the deceased dying moments, hysterical shrieks and laughter, or images of a dead person fondling their bits to porn you didn't even know existed. However, as the brain matter within the skull continues to decompose, the entity will also begin to lose its enhanced intelligence until it is unable to project telepathic images and is returned to its baseline intelligence. When this happens, Scorpses will proceed to seek out another corpse which they can decapitate and use to start the cycle all over again. The circle of life never ceases to amaze and inspire me. That's it for this episode. If you want me to come back to backrooms and do more such things, make sure to like, comment, subscribe with all notifications enabled or I'll turn you inside out. These are the woodlands. They manifest as face-slash-humanoid-like carvings most commonly in wood. Woodlands are entities that visually manifest through the patterns found in plank wood, the interior of logs, or other materials that appear at least visually similar to wood. Its exact form varies, but generally it appears as a humanoid figure or face. They can also scrawl threatening or taunting messages in the wood. The woodlands' verbal assaults consist of death threats and body shaming, but trying to cancel them by carving it into wood hasn't done any good. When exiting its surface, its physical body seems to be made from the material itself, and the entity becomes corporeal. The woodlands target wanderers that are losing their grip on reality. Now, there's a fine line between being paranoid and being cautious in a dangerous situation. A backroom's wanderer needs to be able to jump rope with it. If the target is mentally healthy, or at least as close as you can get in the backrooms, they'll stalk them for miles and make their presence known to induce paranoia. Once a wanderer is questioning the nature of their reality, the woodland will partially noclip out of the surface and grab them before pulling them inside and disappearing. The Wanderer will then be partially no-clipped inside of this material, severing whatever is in contact with the wall. Full vertical segmentation is lethal, but if the Woodland only manages to get a part of you in the wall, you can live if you amputate the appendage before it can drag you further inside. This seems like a rock in a hard place thing, cause it's either chainsaw off your genitalia or die. I don't know what I'd pick. Fun fact, the chainsaw was originally invented to make the removal of the pelvic bone easier and less time consuming during childbirth or any other time you'd need to remove a pelvic bone, I won't tell. This creature is the Strangler. Stranglers are furry bipedal hoofed creatures with a large beak and tentacle-like arms to coil around their victim's neck. Their entire anatomy is designed to minimize noise. They have spongy hooves and soundproof beaks to make sure bone crunches aren't too loud for them. They also tend to have a Doofenshmirtz-esque hunch, theorized to be a defense mechanism against other Stranglers, as they have been seen standing completely straight, reaching a height of at least 8 feet tall. This extra height would make it difficult for other Stranglers to attack. Stranglers reside in level 
158.1, a dimly lit and very dangerous level. Like the town drunk, stranglers only seem to become violent during blackouts. Blackouts are when all of level 58.1's lights shut off in unison for a seemingly random amount of time. Like a desperate man at a rave, they skulk throughout the dark room, feeling for anything with a pulse. They then grab whatever they find and squeeze it until it stops struggling and begin to consume it. These creatures will do this to their own kind as well. I'm not sure how they reproduce, but regardless, it's definitely a lot of choking with the lights off. I regret nothing. When the lights turn on, all stranglers flip shit due to sensory overload and scramble back to their dens, dark holes they contort into and hide in till the next blackout. Stranglers are just afraid of loud noises, so if the level blacks out, just and they won't come near you. The reverse defecation bird. Just when you think you've seen it all, in walks a bird that unshits itself. People are gonna think I made this shit up. I didn't make this shit up. I wish I made this shit up. You can go to the wiki and check. Instances of Entity 40 are extremely common, almost invasive species to the back rooms. Visually, instances of Entity 40 just resemble typical pigeons that would be found populating rather urban and lived in environments of most Western towns and cities. While initially coming across as extremely basic, almost one-to-one -one replicas of typical birds, the rather numerous instances of Entity 40 possess one distinctly differential and somewhat disturbing characteristic. Sometimes something is just so gold that no jokes about it will even hit the same, so I'm just gonna read this straight from the wiki with very little embellishment. Instances of Entity 40 unshit themselves. Yes, they absorb crap on the ground and bring it back into their own bodies. They are known to force feed from the ground back into their own rear during periods of flight. Instances of Entity 40 have the somewhat unsightly and morbid ability to suddenly cause previously dropped bird excrements to quickly shoot up and become a part of them. My god, I love it. This is unironically my favorite entity so far. How this process is done is unknown, and any investigation has proved fruitless. Sometimes people can get hit at such grade speeds with this entity's feces that it can prove lethal. To the untrained eye, it may seem almost impossible to detect when bird droppings may rip upwards towards the sky, or which droppings are ones that can rip up into the heavens. A few seconds before the droppings are going to depart from the ground, they will often act like a magnet towards the bird in question, with any looser parts on the ground lifting or moving up towards the creature, usually happening about 10 seconds before the process occurs. Oh yeah, and there's like a goat that eats popsicles. Entity 666, aka Happy Files, is a string of several websites on the backroom's internet that host instances of an anomalous, seemingly sentient computer virus disguised as various applications. Instances of Entity 666 often masquerade as Backrooms file sharing sites such as fileshare.backrooms and piratebay.backrooms, or video sharing sites such as youtube.backrooms or pornhub.backrooms. These web pages all share the same name, only differentiated by a set of random numbers within the URL. You can only get onto the Backrooms internet in the Backrooms or with a powerful force known as suspension of disbelief. Like a toilet seat for gonorrhea, these websites are based basically just the carrier for the Entity 666 virus. When an individual is downloading the desired program from any variant of Happy Files, it will instead download as a zip file. Once extracted, there will be an unzipped folder containing a TXT file stating, Thank you for downloading this program. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for using Happy Files. Along with a .exe file with a lower quality version of the original icon for the specified program. Once the .exe has been opened, the individual will now be designated Entity 666-A. The program will be an exact replica of the original counterpart of the specified program with no limitations or paywalls, so if you're willing to put up with this spectral technical crap, you can just get a lot of these free cursed softwares. If the program is a utility type program, there will be an icon displaying the face of Entity 666. If the program is a video game, soon after being opened, the player will spot a digital instance of Entity 666, which will begin to follow them slowly before pursuing at great speed, jump scaring the player. Immediately following this, it will crash the computer and shut down all electronics in the room, including any lights, computers, or vibrators. It will then manifest in the room as an obsidian-colored humanoid entity standing roughly 2.1 meters or 6 foot 8. It has a white porcelain-like face sporting sunken yet somehow bulging, unblinking eyes and an unnaturally cavernous smile. This face never changes in any iteration of Entity 666. Even when I tell him that he has the vibes of the guy at the party who tells everybody to add him on FetLife, he refuses to wipe the stupid grin off of his face. This instance will begin to travel to Entity 666 a at a steady and slow pace, and gradually pick up speed. When Entity 666 reaches Entity 666-A, it will again jump scare Entity 666-A, 
in hopes of causing a heart attack. If Entity 666A has a strong stomach and doesn't suffer a heart attack, Entity 666 will rip all of the Wanderer's limbs off and just tell its friends that they died of a heart attack because dead men tell no tales. The file containing Entity 666 will then delete itself from the computer. Alright, f*** it. I wanna play some Red Dead. Then I, like, totally scared him until he had a heart attack. <laughs> oh my god, dude. Next up are the skinless. The skinless, as the name suggests, are humanoid figures that look as though they've been skinned with surgical precision, revealing the inner workings of their anatomical structures, such as their muscle fibers, bones, vascular systems, and organ structures. They ooze a strange fluid behind them, and when examined more closely, it seems to be a mix of every type of human bodily fluid. Yes, every type. Even, even that one. While these creatures resemble humans somewhat in their passive state, when they enter their active state around human prey, they exhibit some very inhuman characteristics. For example, when they see a wanderer, they will stalk it for miles until it can get close enough undetected to strike. The entity will then split open its torso at the rib cage and open up using the ribs like some sort of spooky skeleton bear trap. It will then grab the wanderer swiftly, snap the trap shut with a force on par with the bite of an alligator skewering and trapping the victim in its chest cavity. The veins of the skinless will then detach and move like tendrils to the bleeding holes created by the sharp ribs, and they will weave their way inside of the veins and arteries, digestive system, nervous system, reproductive system, hell, anywhere the wanderer has body fluid. They will then drain the victim of all their blood, saliva, stomach acid, naughty fluid, respective to the victim's sex. They have also been seen laying down with their ribcage open like some sort of horrific mouse trap to pierce the legs of an unassuming wanderer for an easy meal. <laughs> You're all still asking a lot of questions, which I told you not to do, so maybe I'll answer one. What the hell are you? Why are you milking the back rooms? Why haven't you seeked the psychological evaluation that you very obviously need? To be honest, if I see a therapist, I might not be able to connect to my mentally ill audience members. Chances are, that's a significant portion of my demographic. Embracing insanity has done wonders for my mental health. Level Run for Your Life, aka Level Exclamation Point, is a long hallway around 10 kilometers kilometers or a little over six miles long. Wanderers can enter this level by using elevators in the back rooms, they can awaken there if they pass out from substance abuse, or just randomly when they least expect it. This hallway resembles that of a broken down crack house of a hospital, down to every last bloody rusted syringe and mysterious bodily fluid puddle. Except there's a constant red flashing light and blaring alarm noise. Immediately upon entry, the wanderer will hear the bloodthirsty shrieks of a horde of murderous entities approaching at Usain Boltian speeds from a long distance down the hallway. These entities include skin stealers, smilers, butthole fondlers, etc. The only way a wanderer can survive is by running the full distance of the hallway and making it to the end. The wanderer will have to evade hospital beds, medical devices, and even clumps blocking the way. If you see another wanderer running, you can trip them and feed the horde for a few more seconds of space. Who's gonna tell? Not that guy. There's also almond water and food scattered around, so if you're like a marathon sprinter, you can stop and have a snack and a drink. Any doors on the sides of the halls are locked. Don't try opening them or breaking them down. Your frail human arms can't interfere with these unknown forces. It'll just waste the time that you desperately need for running from the living wave of monsters that wants to turn you into nutrients. If an especially fit wanderer manages to get to the end, there will be an exit door that leads to a random level, which hopefully isn't just a void. To be real with y'all, I think if we dropped every one of my subscribers into this level, around 95% of them would die within the first two miles, but hey, maybe I'm wrong. Adrenaline is a phenomenal drug. Let's get into it. Ready? Go! Welcome to the end of the back rooms. After fighting through hordes of entities, traversing an inordinate amount of hazardous levels, and finally smashing the Game Master, you've pulled up to what looks to be the very last level of this insanity-inducing hellhole. That's right, according to some, this seemingly infinite dimension actually has an end to it. Level 922337203685477580 is what humans consider to be the final true level of the back rooms. This 
number is the 64-bit integer limit on a computer, and because y'all are obsessed with simulation technology, the theory is that the back rooms are a simulated reality. Look dude, I've been there. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You humans realize that you're the ones categorizing this. Just because you found carpet land first and called it zero, doesn't mean a literal dimension gives any semblance of a shit where you started counting, right? Your species logic consistently confounds me. This is one of the hardest to enter and most dangerous levels in the back rooms. It looks like a simple, cold, brutalist staircase, around 29 steps tall, that leads upward into an end. Like the frostbitten end of a homeless man's phallus he aimed towards the sky at 7 in the goddamn morning on the sunset strip, the color of the end is not humanly describable. The most one can compare it to is black or white. It is void of any color, so empty that looking directly at it for too long can make humans begin to cry. But I think it's pretty fucking hot. The space continues for at least billions of miles in all directions. Beyond this void is rumored to be the front rooms. However, stupid human ape technology has not yet reached a point in which you can breach this void to escape. This is the final level known to man. No official number can be beyond it. I mean, what did you expect? If you can't get past the void, you're not gonna find it. Just because you can't find it, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That's like not looking to your right and then assuming nothing other than left exists. I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. Human-made cameras have trouble processing this void, as they are terrible at capturing literally anything interesting other than nudes, and sometimes not even then. It is currently rumored that this fake reality, the end, could be a decoy or secret entrance to the true end. There is one exit to this dimension, the elevator right before the staircase. If the elevator opens for you, there are many buttons in the elevator that can take you to all sorts of different places, one of them being level zero. All sorts of entities congregate closer to the end itself to try to find an escape. Either that or they're just playing ookie cookie into the void. The crowds of these dangerous creatures are massive and are often an obstacle to accessing the pit. There is but one entity that lives in the void itself, but it lurks so deeply within the void that there is only one known part to it. It has a long chameleon tongue-like appendage that it uses to snatch entities on the brink of the end before sucking them off into the void for an unknown process that is assumed to be a process similar to digestion. Nah, I'm just kidding. This part was a complete goof that I used so I can look out there unimpeded by the crowds of morons. Snatcher weeds are crimson plants that can be found on the grounds of most outdoor and some indoor levels of the back rooms. When planted, they maintain a crimson color, but they turn black when they are unrooted from the ground. These weeds curl up into tight clumps when in its passive state, and can stretch out five to seven feet when in the presence of prey. Snatcher weeds have been described as strangely sticky, and that's not something I added, it was taken directly from the wiki, so it's not just me being a pervert this time. Wanderers have also reported an odd sensation akin to burning. This burning sensation from the weeds has caused them to be used in many forms of strange Uncanny Valley versions of BDSM. These entities are also known to be able to release toxins similar to the consumption of liquid pain, which is exactly what it sounds like. Unlike Cali weed, Entity 143 leaves are incredibly sharp, capable of causing lacerations and dismemberment. The stems are covered in small, sharp thorns as well. Although difficult due to their variation in length and thickness, it is possible to cut snatcher weeds off. Doing so will cause them to harden, which makes snatcher weeds very useful weapons for those lucky enough to cut a satisfying amount of stem. Snatcher weeds act like normal weeds when not within a five foot radius of wanderers or entities. However, when the targets are within range, like a man on bath salts who sees a delicious face, the behavior of the weeds becomes erratic. Some, like me, do not get harmed by the snatcher weeds at all, because because they know I'll just roll them up and smoke them if they try. Skin givers are creatures with blood red skin, white sunken eyes, and skeletal arms with hundreds of layers of thick skin on the hands. Since the majority of their weight is in their hands, they move in a chimp-like knuckle-walking fashion. While these wet dreams for those with an elephant titus fetish are extremely strong, they move slowly and methodically. These creatures have the ability to apply extra layers of skin to anything their hands make physical contact with. The skin will grow and wrap around the victim, causing itchiness and heat to the real layer of skin. Imagine your entire body becoming biologically uncircumcised, and it's basically like that. Once contact is made, the skin giver will slowly chase the affected person. Over time, more and more layers of skin will grow on the victim until they pass out due to heat exhaustion. When unconscious, the skin giver will tear open the new layers of skin and eat the flesh of the wanderer. The remaining skin will be left to rot behind. Analysis of this extra skin has revealed that it is almost entirely made from scrotal slash foreskin. These entities have a mutualistic relationship with skin stealers, as they often congregate, and the skin stealer will alleviate some of the weight on the hands of the skin giver by taking the excess skin to patch up their own wounds. 
This symbiosis was partially the basis for the theory that evolution is at least partially also how life came to be in the back rooms. And also this t-shirt. Next up are the Curabita birds. The Curabita bird is a large avian that looks like it huffs glue out of a bag. Couldn't possibly be more than goldfish level intelligence behind these eyes. Well, that's not very nice, a big jerk. This cross between a glow stick, a soap bubble, and a dodo bird can be found in any level that contains a decent sized death moth population, as they survive off of the smaller male death moths. They use a long sticky tongue to snag their prey and slurp it back inside of their face hole. Humans have attempted to use this tongue for exactly what you're thinking, and I'm happy to say it went exactly as poorly as you would think. Other than that, they are mostly harmless when it comes to interactions with humans, as they will flee like a little bitch if they notice any creature larger than themselves. They are extremely slow, only able to locomote by flapping their nearly vestigial wings to pathetically doggy paddle through the air. The Curabita bird is almost always in a nearly completely dormant state. They can spend days at a time floating in a single spot, only snapping into action when a perceived threat draws too close, or when a male death moth comes into contact with their tongue. Like a deep sea guppy to the glow of an angler's dangler, or EDP to a cupcake, the death moth is attracted to the bioluminescent tip of the curabita bird's tongue, and will get stuck in the highly adhesive saliva that coats it. Perhaps the most striking feature of the curabita bird is the bioluminescent gel which it stores in the hump on its back. Despite the fact that this gel is semi-solid, it is significantly lighter than air, allowing this strange creature to stay airborne almost indefinitely. You can actually use this to fly, but the caveat is you have to shove a few gallons of bird fluid up your ass. When extracted from the Curabita bird, the gel will maintain its light-giving properties for up to several days. This window of usefulness can be extended almost indefinitely when the gel is exposed to a significant amount of heat. This means that a jar of Curabita gel could serve as a constant light source in warmer levels of the backrooms. I've eaten it. Fucked me up real good, although it's pretty toxic for humans. Oh yeah, and also there's this hermit crab that instead of claws has pool noodles and he, he sucks you. Entity 36, known as Cannibal Cuisine, is an anomalous type of vending machine found within the back rooms. They can look like any sort of front rooms brand vending machines. On the back of these machines always reads a tag, Cannibal Cuisine Productions, Iris Family, from humans, by humans, for humans. As of now, no one has a goddamn clue who the Iris Family is or if they even exist at all. Cannibal Cuisines are supernaturally durable and cannot be destroyed using normal methods. These machines don't require any payment to operate, and the internal systems seem to be a blend of biological and mechanical. For example, instead of a metal coil pushing the product off the shelf and into the slot, this system uses a skeletal human hand. And instead of a button, like a human, you would use the clit to turn it on. I regret absolutely fucking nothing. All products made from Entity 36 are made from human parts. And like a noble hunter-gatherer should, Entity 36 uses all parts of the animal. Some of my favorites from these vending machines include small blocks of flesh wrapped sloppily with a candy bar wrapper, entire heart, carbonated blood with sugar added, dip in a box, chip bag containing chips made from human bone marrow, skin strips dipped in gum, and my favorite, the fermented alcoholic piss. Every 12 hours, the products within a cannibal cuisine will all be instantaneously replenished, appearing out of thin air. Products that have not been taken will simply remain inside. While safe to consume for most multidimensional entities, products from Entity 36 spike human dopamine levels so much that humans can get instantly instantly addicted to these products. Addicted individuals devote themselves to obtaining as much food as they can from the cannibal cuisines and are willing to risk their lives to do so. What's that saying? Crack addiction doesn't give a shit whether or not you think you're gay? Multiple wanderers that are victim to the same instance of Entity 36 may also attempt to harm one another to ensure more food for themselves. Normal side effects of high amounts of dopamine include euphoria, binge eating, addiction, poor impulse control, heightened aggressiveness… Oh shit. Besides generally inciting an extreme feeling of joy, products from cannibal cuisines may also cause a few other effects. For example, the complete and permanent removal of any prior memories pertaining to cannibal cuisines. Any further information on the entity is wiped from the victim's memory after an average of four hours. They will also be unable to eat other sources of food and water, including almond water. Attempting to eat non-Entity 36 food items will result in the food remaining in the stomach and not leaving via digestion unless removed by other means. They'll also have increased hunger and thirst, regardless of the amount of food the victim has consumed. Sometimes they even hear voices emanating from the cannibal cuisines, which become more and more prevalent during the machine's replenishment and the consumption of a product. These voices are often described 
described as blood-curdling screams, soft yet discomforting sobs, and or coming noises. Most victims recall that these voices manifest in the form of a loved one from their past life before entering the back rooms. Oxids are small, bronze-colored arthropods native to level 61, although they have been sighted on other levels. Eyewitnesses have compared them to crabs or pubic lice, albeit much larger and with sharper mandibles. Oxids scurry around various levels searching for objects made out of base metals, such as copper or iron. Much like a snake, they have two glands in the back of their mouths. However, instead of venom, these produce an unidentified acid with the ability to spread rust and oxidation. Once an oxid finds such an object, it will use its acidic saliva to corrode the metal for much easier consumption. If you ask an oxid what that mouth do, the answer would be dissolve. These rusted metals compose its entire diet. Oxids are naturally curious entities and will search any bags, containers, or fleshy orifices for something to eat. Tupperware is recommended as a way to keep them out of your belongings, as plastic does not oxidize. Oxids have strong mandibles to help chew up the rusted metal they live on. However, they will use these in combat if they feel threatened or just bored and sadistic. I'm warning you. I never warn you guys, so you know this is gonna be bad. This entity is cursed. And I'm warning you now because the following content is so foul it goes far beyond the not-for-human-consumption nature of most of the cognito hazards I upload. With that being said, allow me to introduce the most cursed entity in the entire backrooms. The Glock Dookie. This entity empties out a toothpaste tube, fills it with its own feces, urine, seminal fluid, and vomit, and then proceeds to aim the front of the toothpaste tube towards a victim. It will squeeze the end of the tube so as to squirt the contents of the tube out rapidly. This mixture cannot be removed once it touches a person. No known substance can wash the Glock Dookie off. This entity will display different tendencies while in large groups. They've been reported to mass Glock Dookie a victim and then knock out the wanderer with blunt force trauma, pull down their pants, and scream, Get that ass. Soon, a swarm of entities appear and spread the wanderer's ass cheeks open, subsequently spitting into the anus of the unconscious victim. This entity is not cataloged in the wiki or the fandom, and the only place one can find an account of these entities is in a video that I will be linking in the description. It's canon now, and there's not a single fucking thing any of you can do about it. Also, this is the not goldfish. It swims through the air. I'm gonna give you all an AZFK fun fact. I'm 100 meters from your location and approaching rapidly. Start running. Wallpaper wraiths are giant slug-like creatures that stick to walls and ceilings using a red mucus secretion. Their skin is covered in advanced chromatophores, which can replicate the patterns and colors of the walls and ceilings with great accuracy. While this seems like a powerful ability, you can use this to your advantage by leading them to stick to walls with hate symbols and then get them cancelled. These creatures hunt by sneaking up on their prey and extending a tendril-like tongue. They will wrap this tongue around the victim, like any skilled murderer, starting with the mouth to silence any screaming. After encasing the prey completely, Completely, they will either retract the tongue and eat the victim whole, making every mollusk vorophile's dream come true, or drag the prey back into the nest to leave it for its young. Injuring a wallpaper wraith will cause them to spit a paralyzing black liquid that will freeze any entity or wanderer in place, making them incredibly easy to consume. The tongue of these creatures is easily capable of snapping a human neck. Wallpaper wraith's ears are extremely sensitive, and if the entity hears a loud noise, it'll just straight up have a heart attack and die. Boo! Ah! These creatures usually nest inside of the ceilings. The females laying hundreds of eggs until they literally die from exhaustion from it, like a termite queen or the man chicken. When the young wraiths hatch, they will eat the stash of food, red dead bodies, left by their parents, and then they'll eat their siblings. When there are only about seven left, they will proceed to find their own spots for nests, and then they will start hunting to begin the process all over again. Nature's be so beautiful sometimes. I mean, like, not right now. This is awful. But I don't know, man. Go outside. Reviooks are entities that physically remain mysterious, although there is much evidence to their existence and the destruction that their behavior leaves on its surroundings. Reviux will burrow into the ground for several weeks at a time, waiting for wanderers or other entities to walk over them. They have the miraculous ability to heal the ground after they submerge themselves in it, leaving no trace of the destruction that got them underground. After a few seconds of a victim standing over the Reviux, it will burst from the ground, grab the victim, and quickly resubmerge to give them the big subterranean suck. The victim is either crushed by the ground or suffocated within minutes, and then the Reviuk will consume the victim, then coughing up an owl pellet-like waste product useful in teaching children about anatomy. The exact physical appearance of the Reviuk is unclear, as they spend most of their existence underground. However, humans have a rough idea of what they look like. They have large muscular arms in the front, and three small legs in the back. Their feet have a spork-like shape, allowing them to rapidly dig themselves under the ground. The head has eight black beady eyes 
is arranged similarly to that of a spider, and just below these are a proboscis-like mouth which makes this creature a low-hanging fruit for BJ jokes. Males will have large white dots on their body, while females will have several tiny white dots. The splat is an amorphous flesh blob with a thick liquid-like consistency. Contain your orgasms, folks. It has several eyes which move around the body before popping back in in a manner that is described to be similar to boiling. These creatures cling to the ceilings of level zero behind doors waiting for a stupid wanderer to stumble under them. They will make splooshing noises, and apparently it's to attract prey. I'm not saying you won't attract someone, but you're going to attract a very particular and likely very sticky type of someone. When someone enters the door, the splat will latch onto their neck and inject what the wiki calls a poison, but anyone with half a brain knows when it's injected, it's a venom. This venom will cause hallucinations and extreme nausea. I've tried it before for fun, and it wasn't very fun, and I can usually get into nightmarish hallucinations. Most notably, the victim will believe the small room they are trapped in is another hallway, stretching on forever. In the state of their confusion, the victim will inadvertently trap themselves in the room until they die, either from starvation, dehydration, or suicide. The corpse is assumed to be eaten by the entity. If you spot a splat, walk past it slowly, Act natural, but not too natural. And don't run, as like the common movie T-Rex, their vision is based on movement and they seem to be attracted to fast moving objects. You're scared, coward! You got man enough to f with me! You can't last two minutes in my world, bitch! Look at you scared now, you ho! Scared of the real man! I'll f till you love me! I had to get high. I had to back. I'm not sure if this is the weirdest backrooms entity I've ever seen, but it's definitely up there. Entity 161, more commonly known as Leon, is a toddler-sized leech with a pair of long noodle-like boneless arms that end in little points instead of hands. At the very front of his body, he has a ring-shaped mouth filled with three large sharp teeth. No matter what climate one finds this entity in, his skin is somehow constantly wet and slippery, leaving a visible trail of mystery fluid as he slithers around. No valuable scientific data was gathered by forcing a series of humans to drink varying amounts of it. This entity is always adorned in a white collar, a multicolored necktie, and white tuxedo cuffs placed slightly above the points of his arms. Do not insult his tie. He'll take it very personally. He's also always seen with an exaggeratedly tall and skinny light brown top hat. With him, Leon carries a black leather briefcase which he uses to store items he's collected. Despite looking like a standard briefcase, it's able to store objects significantly larger than both it and Leon himself. This entity has been known to function as a wandering salesman of sorts and is fully capable of human speech. However, his teeth are so large that he can't seem to close his mouth over them, causing him to have a permanent lateral lift. What the hell did you put me on the show for? I wish one of your guys had children so I could kick them in their fucking head or stomp on their testicles for you could feel my pain because that's the pain I have waking up every day. If a wanderer encounters him, he will usually make an attempt to peddle a small variety of items to whomever he stumbled upon in exchange for the person's blood. Offering Leon another bodily fluid results in him contacting the authorities. These items can range greatly in value consisting of anything from random junk to highly sought after objects such as royal rations, life insurance, or mescaline. Leon is generally friendly with wanderers, if not also kinda slick. If a wanderer happens to encounter this entity or vice versa, he'll make an immediate attempt to strike up conversation and temporarily join the wanderer on their travels or duties. He'll accompany the wanderer until he's either successfully sold them an item, been shooed off, or simply decided to go somewhere else all on his own. During the times in which Leon is conversing with a wanderer, he'll often make attempts to shift the conversation to the top of his wares in hopes of making a sale. Leon's not really my friend, he just wants my business. Should the wanderer agree to his products, he'll open up the briefcase and advertise a selection of four to five items that usually range in quality and usefulness. While Leon claims to not be a drug dealer, he does sell drugs. The standard prices of items seem to be completely random, but it is possible to haggle with Leon in order to make a desired item cheaper. At the moment, no pattern on what items Leon deems as valuable has been discovered. I found the man's once, and he was selling a new iPhone for the same price as a rotten apple core. No semblance of value at all. It's important to keep in mind not to touch an item unless you're absolutely sure you want to buy it. For whatever reason, Leon considers any item that has been touched bought, and will subsequently claim his payment whether you're willing or not. Sounds like Leon needs to take those online courses that they make every college freshman take. Instead of accepting any form of currency or trade for his items, this entity only accepts payment in the buyer's blood. Whenever one decides to purchase an item, Leon's hat will briefly shudder before the top flips open and spurts a purple gas cloud in the face of the buyer like some sort of Alice in Wonderland Nightman version of a Dr. Seuss book. This gas will completely knock out most wanderers approximately 15 to 20 seconds after inhalation. When the buyer is unconscious, Leon will then proceed to plunge his three teeth into one of the shoulders of the buyer 
vampire and consume the amount of blood he's owed, using a blood-sucking method similar to that of an actual leech. It's believed the gas his hat spits out is supposed to function as an anesthesia, so the buyer doesn't have to feel their blood being sucked out. It's an instant knockout for humans, but for higher level species it's kind of like getting hit with the dentist gas. <laughs> When finished with the payment process, Leon will leave the area and the buyer will wake up about 10 minutes later with a Y-shaped scar on one of their shoulders, a mild soreness in the arm with the scar, and the purchased item sitting on the ground nearby. This entity is a pussy pacifist and will flee at high speeds if the situation gets violent. If cornered, he'll usually resort to hitting the aggressor with a puff of his knockout gas before frantically scrambling away. The only other times Leon gasses something without an agreed sale comes if one tries to steal something from him, as he'll very often manage to knock out any attempted thief with his gas before they can get away. Afterwards, he'll take both the payment for the item and the item itself back. Despite his generally pacifistic nature, Entity 161 has unintentionally killed some wanderers in the past by taking too much blood all at once. He doesn't seem to be aware of the fact that creatures actually need blood to survive. Having stated, they can always just grow more. I mean, like, he's not wrong. However, he does seem to favor specific blood types over others. He'll very often bring up blood types as an icebreaker conversation, and seems to generally lower his prices for types that he favors. Currently, it is believed that his favorite blood type is B positive, while his least favorite is O positive. See, I don't even normally use blood for biological functions, but I allocate resources to make it just so I can get more X from the backroom slug dealer. Well that, and I just throw humans to him for stuff and he doesn't seem to mind. Tape 1, Unidentified Disease. Biohazard warning. Several cases of an unidentified infection have been reported in several parish residents. Do not drink the water. The tumor yielded a strange and frightening discovery. They were filled with aggressive worm-like organisms. The sick are no longer human. It appears the organisms are being birthed from the virus. <laughs> Stay human, don't drink the water. August 8, 1988, an unidentified viral disease begins infecting people in the Tangipafoa waterways. The first evidence of this outbreak is reported by one Dr. Julia Williams. She claims that a virus, hereby nicknamed the Tangi virus, has begun infecting people who swam in the Tikfa River. Several patients were admitted with symptoms consisting of rashy skin, itchy throat, irritated eyes, nausea, and diarrhea. Patient 1, infant, asymptomatic. Patient 2, deceased, complications due to meningitis. Patient 3, child, stable. Patient four, pregnant adult, stable but lost child. Soon after the discovery of this disease, Dr. Williams learns that tumors are growing inside these patients. Not only that, but they seem to be gestating worm-like creatures inside of them. That's pretty neat. The virus initially reproduces in a lytic cycle but undergoes metamorphosis in time, becoming a swarm of parasitic worm-like creatures. The virus state is likely the immature form, making the worms the next stage in the disease's development. The worms, once hatched, make their way to the brain and nervous systems. That's not ominous at all. Apparently, the only way to detect a secondary infection is via autopsy. Upon reporting this to her supervisor, Dr. Williams was assured that samples would be sent to the CDC. For some reason, her supervisor didn't really consider the brain worms a serious threat, despite Julia's tumor-latent research. Julia nosily contacts the CDC herself, and the CDC says it hasn't received the samples. When she confronts her supervisor, he says another parish confirmed the substances to be Giardia. Virology 101. I know you're a human, but a human child wouldn't confuse these two for each other. In the following tape, we find out that despite her repeated warnings, the parish government has been promoting and supplying the water to all the people. The human researcher thinks the CDC was not alerted because the waterways are big money and the parish didn't want a possibly deadly disease tainting that valuable income that can be used to do white stuff out of hooker butthole. From an outside species perspective, I doubt that's the case, but we already know y'all love green paper more than controlling your own brains. She fears this may be a potential pandemic, but that's not the most concerning aspect of this. But first, a quick word from our sponsors, the Tangifoa Waterways.
Wasn't that just breathtaking? Anyways, patient 4 brutally killed her husband with her bare hands and then kidnapped patient 1 after murdering both of the child's parents. Patient 3 also violently attacked his parents to the point of hospitalization and all were last spotted in the waterways near Kate's Crossing. Several people have been reported to have gone missing on the river, and our human researcher is convinced that it's connected. In the next report, we find that the summer went exactly as expected. More sick that recover quickly. So no one gives a shit. The parish is building a landfill near the river. Rumor is they're covering something up. So my idea is if we just fill the river with trash, everyone will blame that for why they're sick instead of the virus. Some say it's a spaceship. I have no idea why they're saying that. It seems kind of out of nowhere. She says she's going to threaten to go to the press and was terminated from her job immediately. When she returned to her office, she found a tape on her desk with a note that said, Lab 8, come at night. The following was recovered from a missing persons case. Tape 7 is called Alien. Apparently, her supervisor and his assistant were the ones who left the tape. They were trying to figure out who they can trust with the current threat. They believe most of the parish government has been infected. The virus is sentient. It doesn't want to just spread. It wants to control. The worms spread throughout the nervous system so they can override the host when needed. Hell, alright, game recognized game. This entity knows how to control a nervous system like a natural. The tumor acts as a second brain. Most will simply succumb to the virus and lose control, a small portion will die, and the remaining victims will mutate into giant amphibious-like creatures, as is the obvious next step. Afterwards, they went to her supervisor Jim's home and had an orgy. Jim explained that the local government was going to introduce the virus into the water supply. They discussed plans of how to go public over a nice bottle of wine. So romantic. Suddenly, she awoke and realized she had passed out. Don't worry, this story gets dark, but not that dark. She was alone, and Jim had left a note. Welcome to the family and see you back at work in two weeks. Last night, Jim seemed confident that they could get the CDC and military involved. She returns to work feeling under the weather. <coughs> Foreshadowing! But her and Jim have a big meeting today, so the show must go on. Jim wasn't at work today, but he left the bottle of wine they shared two weeks ago with instructions to analyze it. So she did. Finding samples of the virus. She's infected with the Tangy virus. Called it. What a twist! She immediately left, and as she drove away, the staff of the entire building watched her from the parking lot, smiling deviously. Jump to February 5th, 1990. She's working in a veterinarian's office, poisoning her body with antiparasitic drugs and chemotherapy meant for dogs. I've been there, homie. Fun fact, dog Xanax is just regular Xanax, but smaller. Do with that information what you will. She's 40 pounds underweight, bald, and her mouth is covered in sores, but she's kept the disease from overtaking her, buying her time until she can find a cure. By late April, she can feel the worms scratching at her skull, the drugs becoming less effective. Her fingers are spasming, her eyes are twitching, she is dying. May 5th, 1990, she's been having strange dreams, thinking about Ireland, France, moving to the States for med school. June 15th, 1990, I miss my mom and my dad. There's so much I wanted to do. I wanted to meet someone, grow old, have kids. Now I'll never do anything. August 27th, 1990, I can hear them now. They want me to consider them my children. I consider them a plague. September 21st, 1990. I lost my job at the vet's office. My memory isn't what it used to be. I'm mailing these tapes to the FPTV cable station. The council too. Maybe they can use what I learned to save us. October 5th, 1990. I'm ending things tonight. If anyone watching this wants to low my last words there, boil anything you drink. It kills the virus. After the old FPTV building was torn down, hundreds of VHS tapes needed to be digitized and cataloged. Most of it seemed mundane, but on 12.03.90, a mysterious message appeared in the channel's nightly ad sections. It appeared only once. Don't trust your government. They have sold you out. You have been warned. Why would anyone trust the government? What do you think, I'm an idiot? Three days later, an ill-timed Boyle advisory appeared during a pre-recorded newscast. Man, it's hysterical. <laughs> By working with the property owners and other concerned groups throughout the parish, we have made great strides in cleaning the river such as this. The Nittobany River is a big concern of ours. By having the landfill nearby, it does create a possible uh, image of polluting that river, but I can assure you, we 
at the landfill are making every effort that we possibly can to see that the landfill does not pollute any river, any stream, any body of water uh, throughout this parish. And I am This is the dumbest sentient virus I've ever met. And I don't say that lightly. You infect an entire town's worth of people and you choose the most fifth grade science teacher ass looks like a priest that touches kids motherfucker to be your wooden actor? You want people to pay attention. You get the two most attractive people in town and make them get naked. I guarantee people will watch your water commercial or whatever this is. I like to imagine this guy seeing his pre-recorded newscast with the boil water advisor in it and then just like slumping down into his chair. Boiling water saves lives. You just gotta make sure to drink it while it's still boiling though or else it's not safe. Within a week of the boil water advisory, the parish was gripped in an environmental disaster. They responded to this by bragging about their health center. And then they said you should go there if your health gets a bit fucky wucky. In the following few days, the boil water advisory was dropped with no warning or news coverage. Just a strange 15 second spot saying the boil advisory was lifted. And the parish government adopted a strange aggressive pro-drinking water campaign? And terror has come to America. And this typical day in anywhere USA, whether rural or urban, will be forever changed. In the aftermath of such devastation, we'll see a shift, a return in focus to the small town roots of morality. A morality that has remained rooted and intact beneath the camouflage of the everyday citizen's hustle. Life is a fragile gift that is delivered to us in pieces, in small moments, and it only achieves meaning as we cherish and blend the pieces, even the seemingly insignificant pieces, into a full universal whole. Okay, this ad immediately screams to me that the water is not safe. Despite the continuous pro-water ads, the Tangifoa Parish seemed to be getting back to normal. We then see a newscast with a pro-drinking water ad, followed by an anti-drinking water biohazard warning. Biohazard warning. Unknown substance detected in the water. Do not drink the water. Do not bathe in the water. Do not give to pets. Boiling is not enough. Water could be highly toxic. Something unnatural is in the water. The sick are no longer human. Stay human. Don't drink the water. Guys, this is you in politics all over again. I'm not gonna pick a side just because you hate each other. You need to recognize that you're both stupid. According to those living in the parish at the time, panic followed this message's broadcast. No idea why that would happen. It just pointed out the one resource keeping you alive is literal poison. Anti-water messages began to appear during random broadcasts. Within days of the warning, parish officials began working around the clock at the landfill. What they were doing was never disclosed to the public. Following this, the following message was played 24-7 for a week. until it was abruptly stopped by a different message. Nothing was ever said about the odd event ever again, except right now, which is when we're talking about it. Wait, how does this video know that no one ever talked about it again? How do you like, can you check that? Most consider it a joke. A few think it was something more sinister. 
We will probably never know, but I'm gonna tell you it's monsters definitely. Update, the Tangifoa government has asked the uploader to take down the videos, and he's not sure how much longer they'll stay up. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and say fuck the Tangifoa government, Pahoa, Tangi Pahoa, uh -uh, and keep my videos up. Not really, I'm sure you're wonderful people, and if you have an issue, we can talk this out rather than just going through YouTube. In the late 90s, an unnamed storm settled over southeast Louisiana. Flash floods occurred without warning. Most of the population was trapped when the Tangifoa River overflowed. The area was devastated with the town of Cates Crossing being hit the hardest. The fire department was sent to evacuate citizens. Despite their best efforts, the bodies of over 200 people were never found. Most blame the rising rivers, but some say it was something else. The men and women serving that day still don't speak of the Great Flood. This tape is the only first-hand account of that event, and I'm just gonna play it in its entirety. Gary, come in. What's your ETA? Five minutes, give or take. Copy that. Call her back when you get on the scene. Roger that. Over and out. Molly, come in. Go ahead. I'm at the old church and there's nobody here. You at the old Baptist? Looking right at it. And it's him. Somebody must have beat you to it. Look, we got an elderly couple southbound. Can you do it? Then four. I'm on it. Hey Molly, the elderly couple is in my egg. We need to call HQ and see if someone's making these rescues. 10-4, I'll put the word out. Hey Molly, I'm at the Collins Wood subdivision. Where are they? All the way in the back. 10-4. Molly, I'm at the back of the Collins Wood. No one's here. There's no way someone else evacuated 30 people. Have you heard anything from HQ? That's a negative. Try again. What the hell was that? Sorry, trying to get some caffeine. N no, I, I heard something. Wouldn't worry about it. Probably just an animal. The other guy said they've been hearing all sorts of stuff. Look, I'm gonna... Um, Start making my way back to you, okay? Ten four. Gary, come in. How close are you to North Street? Mm, about a block away. We have a Jane Doe in need of medical. She has lacerations on her right arm. Says she was attacked by a monster in the middle of evacuation. Oh, what? I don't know. Probably was a snake or gator. Hold on. <laughs> Gary, I'm gonna have to let you go. Some kind of emergency in the front office. Nothing like a flood to bring out the best in people. Again, there's no one here, but something doesn't seem right. Molly, you there? Molly, come in, please. Jesus Christ, that sounds close.
Lieutenant Gary Davis was never found. During the cleanup, rumors of monsters in the water circulated throughout the community. However, the parish quickly squashed those rumors. People to this day go missing in the Tangifoa River. We invite you to come visit the best kept secret in Louisiana, Tangipaho Parish. Business is booming, restaurants have reopened, miles of waterways are ready for you to enjoy. Every weekend, there's something fun to do in our little parish. Since the Great Flood, we have rebuilt our community into the perfect place to raise your family. So come and visit your friends in Tangipo Parish. You might even find you'll never want to leave. But if you do, we'll be happy to send a piece of our community home with you. We here in Tangipo Parish are proud to announce Tangi Water will be available in every major supermarket in America. And who knows, maybe soon, people all over the world might get a chance to enjoy a cool, refreshing taste of tangy water. Tangy water, it'll change you. Oh, uh, shit. Looks like we gotta save this species dumbass again, huh? But I do know we're near New Orleans, so let's go drink in the street? If you enjoyed this video, please go check out the original project. It's super underrated and I wanted to give this awesome thing a shout out and hopefully give more attention to it. Because this great work honestly deserves many more eyes on it. The Mystery Flesh Pit. I know that sounds dirty. I promise it's not. It's a living cave believed to be the internal organs of a leviathan creature extending more than 19,000 feet into the earth. So gargantuan that a plethora of otherworldly creatures make up a common complex eat or be eaten ecosystem inside of its bowels. The only thing more colossal are the memories that you and your loved ones will make on your vacation to the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park, a Lovecraftian vista that's safe and fun for the whole family. God damn it! The Mystery Flesh Pit National Park is a now defunct national park in Texas. We know about this park because of one artist, Trevor Roberts, aka Strange Vehicles on Reddit, who has an extensive collection of media and artifacts relating to the park. They've done a great job documenting it, and I'll be linking to their work in the description. The cave was first reported in a letter from an employee of an oil company to one Colton Fleming on May 2nd, 1973. To better understand the gravity of this discovery, I'm going to read a section from this letter. This thing that those old boys found is some kind of organic deposit that must go down at least five or six hundred feet by my reckoning. Not a fungus either. This thing breathes and makes sounds same as any other creature. And it bleeds. God, how it bleeds. Soon after its discovery, a deep earth mining pit by the name of Anodyne stepped in and began managing the flesh pit. Anodyne was responsible for creating and maintaining, and I use that second word very loosely, the infrastructure around and inside the mystery flesh pit. They got it sanctified as a national park, meaning it is preserved by the government but can still be used by companies independently. Since Anodyne maintained access to the resources, they had the genius idea of mining through the creature's internal organs and tissues used for the strange materials inside. Anodyne used these never-before-seen biological materials in a strange myriad of new products. For example, a computer that processes information using a neural tissue from the creature. The profits and expansion turned this mining company into a multi-industry conglomerate mega company. The local populace tried to capitalize on it as well, and the town identity shaped around the pit, like Roswell in UFO culture. But not everyone was in love with the pit. This thing was hard to sell at first. Okay, so we have a giant sarlacc pit in the middle of Texas, and we want people to willingly climb down its throat. But how do we market it? Hypnotize the children? Get out of my head. Enter Caver Coop. Caver Coop was a fictional character that starred in animated children's propaganda films to make people not afraid of the cave. This character became so popular that they created Caver Coop's spooky Halloween carnival, with fun children's activities such as haunted hayrides, scary petting zoo signed liability waiver required, and blood. In the belly of the beast lies an ecology that blurs the line between what is ecosystem and what is immune system. The majority, if not all, of the fauna is blind because before humanity lit the inside of this creature's body, it was in complete darkness. Meet the abyssal copepod, a crustacean-like creature that can grow up to 20 feet or 6 meters long. The copepod has a varied diet, including humans. Many accidents in the park involve these misunderstood beasts and over-eager tourists. They also got these weird little 
crabby fingers. If you look around a bit, you're certain to find macrobacteria sliding across the flesh scape. These massive 12 foot bacterial blobs are unlike anything else seen on the surface. Macrocosms of the single celled life we frequently encounter but never see. Equally as strange, the amorphous shame looks like a pile of loose organs with no rhyme or reason. It's actually theorized to be the ancient descendant of a weasel that crawled into the cave. All of its body parts became vestigial and shriveled away over time, and now it's just a pile of fleshy bits that squeezes throughout the folds of the organism, absorbing nutrients in a fashion similar to osmosis. A rare encounter. A lone gasp owl stares blankly into the distance and sounds its mating call. <coughs> <laughs> These are just the tip of the iceberg, as there are many more elusive oddities such as the shrieking cloistropod, stinging triocanth, gastric bristleworm, and the Venus shamble. Keep an eye out for them. I mean, as long as you've signed your waivers, I don't really care, but you're probably gonna want to anyway. Now that you've signed your liability waivers, it's time to have some fun. But before we get going, here are some state-mandated safety tips that we've developed from good old-fashioned trial and error. Remember to stay a safe distance away from creatures in the pit. If it changes its behavior because of you, looks at you, raises its antennae, secretes scent enzymes, or begins making territorial clicks while trying to locate you, you are too close. Allow all organisms to continue unhindered and you may just be afforded the opportunity to safely observe these amazing creatures in their natural habitat. It's always important to be aware of your surroundings to avoid hazards. Remember, you're in the internal systems of a living organism, and this environment is actively hostile towards human life. This calcified multicolored formation is known as the Circus Clown Chymus, a beautiful yet dark reminder of why you should always stay on the trail. A group of performing clowns fell into to the upper maw of the entry orifice, and a dilation of an epiglottal fold allowed them to slide into a then unreinforced area of the pit. Rescue personnel were able to locate them in a digestive sac, but they had already been heavily digested. Many of them were still alive, but they fused together as their giblets melted and now existed as one large runny writhing mass. An experimental antacid was applied to the gooey screaming mound, but it was too late. The compound flash calcified the mass to the hauntingly stunning formation you see in front of you. While this is brutal, it's still not the worst case scenario of what can happen in the pit. I mean, could you imagine what could have happened if these performers didn't sign waivers? On rare occasions, creatures from the megafauna's body will venture out onto the surface and drag animals back down into the pit. In the uncommon instance that they aren't immediately consumed, they can undergo strange phenomena known as anatomical amalgamation that we are proud to say happens nowhere else on the planet. This process results results in a compound organism, which is a hybrid of different surface animals. This process is not fully understood, but we do know that it often results in partial fusion of major body elements and sometimes the relocation of eternal organs to the outside of the body. Should you encounter one, please don't feed it or engage in any other activities that could prolong its suffering. In the unlikely event that you find a compound organism containing one or more human beings, please contact the park staff and you'll be entered in a raffle to receive a complimentary flesh pit t-shirt or hat. Have you or a loved one been combined with one or more white tail bucks while visiting the pulsating vistas of the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park? All new from Anodyne, it's the Brain Case. Now your brain, and if you're lucky, spinal cord can exist in the new streamlined state-of-the-art fishbowl life support system. If you purchase the premium package, you could even get a vocoder to communicate and some of your sense organs back to deliver a sensory experience close to which of that you previously enjoyed. All for one low price of 99 99 99 99 your journey into the flesh pit will begin as you descend an elevator deep into the beast and arrive at the lower visitor center. This expansive multi-story shopping complex has everything. Restaurants, clothing stores, romantic depots, the whole nine yards. Some of the restaurants were accused of serving the meat from the walls of the cave, but it was denied by the park. People have tried the meat, though, and confirmed that it was too gamey to market to even the most adventurous of eaters. However, the arthropod monsters running around are reportedly delectable when steamed with a side of butter. I'm guessing they taste like somewhere between lobster and crab. Experience the majesty of nature from the inside on one of our many hikes. For a breath of fresh air, try visiting the northern bronchial forest. On the Swallowed Hole tour, you experience a Vorophile's dream in reverse and climb up an eight-story esophagus. Be careful, this one is marked for those who don't have a fear of being eaten alive. For the refined consumer, consider visiting the Intrapark Wellness Resort in the stomach, overlooking 
the beautiful gastric seas. This isn't just a family park, if you know what I mean. If you're looking for a romantic getaway, the amniotic fluid springs are the perfect place to put the spark back in any relationship. The fluid is an aphrodisiac, has healing properties, and guests sometimes report making life-lasting emotional connections in the pit. The springs range in dilution. The higher the dilution, the stronger the effects. If you are visiting a spa below the green line, please consult a physician beforehand. If you are visiting a spa below the yellow line, please consult a religious figure or sexual wellness counselor beforehand. The areas with lower concentration are open to all ages, but after a few people caught cases from the FBI, we decided to restrict the springs in the pit with the highest concentrations to 18 years of age or older. You may have come across this amniotic fluid before you even step foot in the park. This juice has led to an effective treatment for Alzheimer's, cancers, and many other life-threatening illnesses. Anodyne also provides it to companies to create consumer goods like Coke Heartthrob, the Feel Good McFlurry, and our proprietary aphrodisiac liqueur. So you're probably wondering why this place got shut down. Let me read the entire incidents report from July 4th, 2007 because I'm legally obligated to. Incident Timeline Start of relevant timeline. 10.29 a.m. July 4th. Unseasonably high rains force park administration to cancel a July 4th concert and fireworks display scheduled to take place on the surface park grounds. Many visitors who had already purchased tickets to the event become upset and a decision is made to extend the park hours until midnight for those who had purchased event tickets. 8 p.m. Normal closing time for National Park. A typical shift change of reduced night staff in the control room takes place. 9.16 p.m. Harvesting crews working in the western extremities of the organism set a new extraction record to meet a quota for bonuses in time for the holiday weekend. 9.30 p.m. Control room operators initiate a routine system self-test and discover a relay fault error resulting from increased electrical demand from mining equipment and tourist infrastructure. A control room operator logs the fault and notifies an on-duty engineer. 9.41 p.m. July 4th. Water drainage from surface rain into entry orifice begins to collect in the sand gullet. Drainage pumps are automatically activated by a sensor system but fail to initialize due to to relay fault. An emergency backup pump running on a separate emergency circuit is automatically activated. 9.42 p.m. A critical alarm in the control room alerts operators that the emergency water pump has seized and is inoperative. Under lubrication of the pump's implier bushings resulted in corrosion due to the moist interior of the flesh pit environment. 9.48 p.m. Technicians arrive at the primary pump station to discover the sand gullet almost completely submerged. Water begins to pour over the dorsal respiratory ridge and into the bronchial bulbules. Control room operators divert power to hydraulic stint ramps to brace for expected choke response. 9.51 p.m. Technicians repair a relay fault as the control staff resets the park electrical grid. The grid is offline for 45 seconds. The automatic PA system does not notify guests as the system is scheduled to automatically shut down at the normal 8 p.m. closing time. The temporary lapse of lighting causes many guests to become panicked and return to the main gantry lift at the lower visitor center. 9.52 p.m. A choking action from the organism begins 31 seconds into the electrical reset. The main dorsal trunk violently flexes. Lack of power to the hydraulic arming rams causes irreparable damage to several sections of internal infrastructure. 9.53 p.m. As the electrical system finishes the reboot cycle, the dynamic hydraulic actuator supporting the lower visitor center overcorrect for stability, not accounting for the shift in the wall lining of the next seal cavity in which the visitor center facility is anchored. Two of the six structural supports are torn from their foundations, which causes the facility to list 20 degrees off vertical. The base joint of the vertical entry gantry is bent beyond its design limit angle. 9.54 p.m. The master alarm is tripped automatically. Surface facilities are notified as response teams are given the order to mobilize. 9.56 p.m. Park rangers are dispatched to rescue groups of visitors trapped in partially collapsed tunnels and trails. 10.03 p.m. Continued movement of the organism combined with rainwater causes one of the upper entry gantry supports to slip. An outbound elevator conducts an emergency stop stranding over two dozen visitors. 10.05 5 p.m. Tremors registered as far away as the DFW Metroplex. 10.06 p.m. Soil liquefaction destabilizes surface facilities in and around the organism. Dilation anchors begin retracting to keep the entry orifice open. 10.12. A master failsafe is activated by the automatic park management system. 20,000 liters of a compound are injected
injected into the superorganism via a distributed network of relay stations located throughout its known internal anatomy. 10.12 p.m. Tremors and convulsions intensify as the entry gantry connection to the lower visitor center detaches completely. The lower visitor center begins to collapse downward into the nexial cavity. 10.12 p.m. Peristatic muscle action of the nexial cavity begins to exert substantial pressure on the outer structure of the lower visitor center facility. 10.15 p.m. The prime labioid junction just west of septum falls geobiological feature flexes into an open position, releasing a torrent of lastrogastric chyma into the dorsal trunk. It is likely that this was a reaction to the acinetin injection. 10.16 p.m. Peristatic spasms force the caustic chyma slurry through the nexial cavity and up the lower and upper moisture crops towards the surface orifice. 10.16 p.m. Many guests attempting to flee the stalled elevator near the entry orifice attempt climbing out the upper moisture crop but are ultimately unsuccessful due to the torrential rains causing the surface to become very slippery. Many end up falling back into the maw. 10.17 p.m. The chyma slurry erupts from the surface orifice in a geyser several hundred meters in height. Large pieces of undigested organic matter crush several vehicles and damage windows. 10.19 p.m. Following the several minute long ejecta event, a deep and incredibly loud roar erupts from the entry orifice as ground tremors intensify further. Large extremities begin surfacing through bedrock and soil approximately 30 to 120 kilometers from the entry orifice. 10.25 p.m. The acrid smell of the gastric ejecta can be detected as far as Odessa, Texas. 10.26 p.m. Two park service vehicles and a tour vehicle containing park service employees and several guests attempt to ascend through the entry orifice tube. 10.27 p.m. Parastatic action crushes one or more of the tour vehicles and sucks the other two vehicles back into the nexial cavity and down into a digestive organ. These vehicles are presumed destroyed. 10.58 p.m. The Pentagon is given authorization from the White House to use nuclear force if necessary to prevent the organism from entering a non-dormant state. 11.02 p.m. The on-site operations director within the lower visitor center control room initiates a final fail-safe measure in the form of redacted contingency measure. 11.02. Master log event records successful spin-up of the redacted contingency measure. 11.05 p.m. Lower visitor center structural integrity is critically compromised resulting in total collapse. 11.05 p.m. Data connection with lower visitor center is severed. 11.13 p.m. Spasms and motor action of the superorganism begin to noticeably subside. Response teams begin to descend into the surface surface orifice to attempt rescue operations. 11.19 p.m. Response team encounters visitor group which had attempted to escape from stalled elevator. Most are dead. The remainder are mortally wounded and partially digested due to gastric ejecta. 11.42 p.m. Radio contact established with ranger vehicle trapped in oyster shame. Due to ventricle closure, no feasible rescue strategy can be developed before complete mastication occurs. 11.56 p.m. Response team confirms that redacted contingency measure and associated facility are still intact and operating. 11.58 p.m. Texas Governor Rick Perry formally declares a state of emergency for Gumption County. 12.22 a.m. July 5th. Response teams route data slash power umbilical to new base camp in redacted contingency measure facility. 12.35 a.m. Three interpit life forms are identified as having been ejected into the surface. Fifteen visitors are injured and seven are hunted by the interpit life forms during panicked evacuation of surface resort. 12.41 a.m. Park staff managed to kill the three large life forms. 1.02 a.m. National Guard helicopters begin in delivering supplies and personnel to aid in site containment. 1.58 a.m. Field hospital is constructed to care for wounded staff and visitors. 2.37 a.m. Initial damage surveys report catastrophic destruction of internal park infrastructure. It geobiology has dramatically changed in hazard level. 3 a.m. Emergency teleconference of anodyne executive leadership. National Parks Director and Security of the Interior are present. 3.12 a.m. Executive decision is made to initiate FEMA response and assemble a task force for containing superorganism. 4 a.m. Media helicopters and vehicles begin to report on the scope of the disaster. 4.39 a.m. Base camp technicians begin to spin down redacted contingency measure. Large fracture due to inertial stress have appeared on mineral components. Engineers advise against reinitializing redacted contingency measure until mineral components can be replaced or repaired. 6.08 a.m. Ground personnel begin assembling assembling a pump system to inject industrial sedative into the superorganism. Transport trucks containing industrial sedative arrive. 9.45 a.m. Emergency teleconference of anodyne shareholders. 11.20 a.m. Several injured visitors inexplicably leave field hospital and begin walking towards the open pit orifice. Approximately 38 individuals are able to crawl back into the orifice over the course of eight hours. None are recovered. 3.51 p.m.
p.m. Radio transmission from trapped ranger vehicle ceases. Many speculate that other small groups of visitors and staff are still trapped. End of relevant timeline. This incident is responsible for over 750 fatalities, 1,800 major injuries, and 18,000 people sought medical and psychological treatment for symptoms including chest pains, shortness of breath, nausea, birth defects, hallucinations, depression, anxiety, internal bleeding, sore throat, and headaches as a result of the gastric ejecta that was released into the atmosphere. The investigators have concluded that this disaster was caused by Anodyne's negligent practices and because this was bound to happen with something that's literally a testament to man's hubris built inside of a giant monster. But it totally wasn't their fault at all because stop asking questions and go home. The most fascinating of the many conspiracy theories that surround the mystery flesh pit national park is the legend of the marrow folk. The marrow folk are thought to be a humanoid species that evolved to live in the pit. Some marrow folk conspiracy theorists believe they evolved from humans who began living in the superorganism millions of years ago. Reported sightings of these people are thought to be gas bowels being mistaken for the flesh Bigfoot. By name alone, the marrow folk are likely to make their homes in the holes of the megafauna's bone marrow. If they look similar enough to be mistaken for a gas bowel, they're likely somewhat to resemble them, but larger and more humanoid in shape. I would suspect that they would survive either by harvesting meat and biological tissue from the marrow and the walls, hunting interpit life forms and tourists, or a little of each and a little cannibalism here and there to keep things interesting. The mystery flesh pit truly is a dark, moist, slippery, undiscovered frontier. Even since the last video, our team has more hypotheses about the elusive biological marvels that make their home in the pit. The Venus Shamble most likely used uses its vascular extensions both to feed off of nutrients and fluids from the anatomy of the pit, and also for locomotion. I'd guess that many a tourist have woken up in a twisted weave of veins slowly sapping their moisture. Heike kinda looks like a Dumbo octopus being swallowed by a sea cucumber with such force that it crapped out all of its veins through its skin. This is the lesser copepod. It's like the abyssal copepod, but apparently lesser. I reject that notion. He's not the lesser copepod. We're gonna call him the short king copepod. Let's talk about about the ballast sirens. My theory is that they're located in the amniotic ballast. When people are under the extreme aphrodisiac effects of the strongest springs, chances are they will be in a hypersensual and very suggestible state, and they will want to stick their bits in literally anything that has a slot that it fits with. The ballast siren will attempt to attract these horned up inebriated individuals like a siren to put their bits in one of the holes, and then the suction grabs them and they suck all of the internal organs out of the naughty hole. Or maybe they don't do that. Who knows? I just made all that up from context from its name and anatomy. You got a better idea? Leave it in the comments. The gastric bristle worm is named after a regular bristle worm, which is a common nautical animal that often acts as a decomposer. The gastric bristle worm likely explores the digestive system like an ocean and helps the megafauna digest organic material. If you found yourself unlucky enough to be being digested by the pit, just know that this thing will be swimming in and out of your melting skin while it happens. Moving on, the bone mite is a large parasitic mite that feeds off the bone bone marrow and blood of the superorganism. If these mites function like I think they do, then I suspect very soon tourists will be found with no bones or blood and their skin covered in bone mite bites. My theory about the little wiggly abomination that looks like an upside down Christmas tree called the gangliotoad is that it's basically a nematode, or a parasitic roundworm, except it's on the scale of the gargantuan creature that is the superorganism and thus could probably slurp all your blood out so hard that your skin and organs crumple up like a drained Capri Sun. The shrieking cloistropod looks like a Cronin themed quadruple ended vibrator that operates solely on biological pulsation. It looks like it might root itself into the walls of the flesh and then shriek, I guess? I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what this one does. I'm moving on. The stinging triocanth kind of looks like a giant wiggly wasp with wiggly deer horns. I'm guessing it acts like a giant wiggly wasp too and stings the crap out of whatever it sees until it's no longer alive. Remember folks, everything in the pit actively wants to end your existence. So actually like you would if you were in the wild in Australia. Well, maybe not that extreme, but you know, the same idea. There's reports of an interpit life form capable of creating a hallucinogenic venom in glands behind its eyes and spraying it at those who disturb it as a defense mechanism. I will call this creature an expectorate. It has two large, seemingly bioluminescent eyes it uses to see in the inky darkness of the guts, and four appendages which it uses to drag itself through the folds of the flesh scape. It's often camouflaged in the crevices of the pit anatomy, and uncautious tourists have been sprayed with large amounts of venom that can cause radical perspective shifting and perception of new insights, euphoria, immersive experiences, disassociation and non-responsiveness, sensual enhancement, dysphoria, 
fear, terror, or panic. Testing of this venom reveals it to be a chemical very similar to 5-MeO-DMT, a powerful psychedelic produced in the venom glands of the Bufo alivaris toad that lives across the southern United States. For this reason, I have deduced that the expectorate is a Bufo alivaris that made its home out of the pit, and then evolved like the amorphous shame. Nah, I made this guy up completely, he's not a part of the MFP, but I had you though, right? The Gift Garden is yet another example of how the mystery flesh pit is capable of feats that boggle the entire scientific community. Deep in the super organism is an organ composed of large bronchioles containing tens of thousands of what were soon deemed gift sacs. These sacs receive nutrients from arteries, but this nutrient-rich slurry also contain construction materials such as plastic, metals, wood, and silicate. The gift gardens would use these materials to grow objects that were familiar to a guest. Examples include childhood toys, photos of loved ones, and old appliances. Closer inspection of these items revealed them to be not perfect copies, but instead occasionally functional but often convincing recreations of these objects. Once the gift had gestated enough, the sack would turn translucent, signifying that the guest's gift is ready for collection, and will be available to them for a nominal fee after harvesting. Scientists have absolutely no idea how this organ works, but some theorize it's a process involving the pit's neural tissue receiving brain waves from the humans inside of it. While the idea of the pit having telepathy is unsettling, there's no reason to think it would use this for predatory purposes. Park is closed, get the fuck out. A subterranean superorganism slash ecosystem that inspires a primal terror even more severe than my AirPods falling out when I'm using the urinal. While the pit remains as fleshy as ever, recent scientific findings in the form of an MFP Tumblr Q&A make it slightly less mysterious. Although, some just raise more questions than answers, so I just, I just lied to you. We know a decent bit about the flesh pit at this point, but what actually the f*** is it? Geo and Venterio biologists have reached an understanding that the superorganism displays pentadecagonal symmetry. Although this isn't your grandma's mind-bending leviathan 15-legged starfish monster, its biology is not nearly as simple on the vertical axis as it is on the horizontal. With this discovery, one of the most pressing questions about the superorganism has finally been answered. That being, how many holes does it have, where are they, and what can we use them for? From the most recent Q&A, is the main entry orifice the only one the mystery flesh pit possesses? If not, were the other ones also used by Anodyne for resource exploitation? This isn't the first time I've stumbled across orifice exploitation on the internet and was pleasantly surprised. Anyway, in addition to the main entry orifice, an additional 14 orifices were eventually discovered, bringing the total number to 15. These other 14 orifices are arranged in a loose circle around what is assumed to be the true center of the organism, and they were plugged up by the Bureau of Land Management because they made up an excuse or something to cover the fact that they're into that sh**. You have a weird f sh dude, just own it, it's not a big deal. There were plans for Anodyne to make another one of these holes gape to unnatural proportions to create a second gate for the park, but the 2007 tragedy happened before that could take place. I had so many clips that I want to, but can't not use to portray the phrase gaping hole. <laughs> we know a lot about the anatomy of this creature, but what about its most important organ? Unfortunately, we don't yet know what its cock looks like, so I'll just have to explain you the brain. Just like you, the superorganism does not have a traditional brain. Rather, the Permian superorganism contains what geobiologists term a distributed heuristic hierarchical nervous system. From the text, this central ring connects five enormous miles wide concentrated brain regions which are theorized to comprise a central nervous system system used by the superorganism to simultaneously think as well as manage the many hundreds of miles of the mystery flesh pit's anatomy. The management system is further divided into hundreds of superganglia, managed by each pentalobe, broadly categorized into alpha, beta, and gamma variants. Alpha ganglia manage thousands of local nerve clusters responsible for executive functions such as motor control, digestive management, lymph production, vascular management, as well as dozens of other functions. Gamma ganglia are almost the reverse counterpart to the alpha ganglia. Gamma ganglia manage the many thousands of nerves and sensory receptors throughout the mystery flesh pit, translating this enormous amount of info into usable data for the central pentalobal nervous system. Unique are the many beta ganglia clusters which seem to fill in a sort of local memory function which has no direct analog in mainstream biology. These beta ganglia clusters exhibit phenomenal storage capacity for stimuli response memory and were often harvested for their biological
biotechnological applications before the 2007 tragedy. In addition to this weird collection of pseudo-brains, on an expedition, researchers discovered an organ at a far-off extremity that was analogous to an eye. It was around 1.2 kilometers or 0.7 miles in diameter, with a retinal region much larger than a football field, and a highly evolved lens. These organs are attracted into an internal carapace to protect from the rock that it is surrounded by. I'm putting a bounty on this massive eye. One million flesh coins to whoever can bring it to me still preserved and transplantable. I'm working on an art project. <laughs> Told ya, Mystery Flesh Pit is the best hunting and fishing spot on Earth. Great date spot too. So good that if it weren't for the spermicidal effects of the amniotic springs, the guy who writes my awful jokes would be taking care of a kid right now. It's no secret that regular old earth fauna that falls or gets dragged kicking and screaming and praying into the pit can get amalgamated into combination flesh monsters, but have you ever wondered how big the largest compound organism to grace the flesh scape was? Venteriologists theorized that once, hundreds of years ago, a herd of longhorn cattle over a thousand strong were consumed by the pit. These cattle underwent a mass amalgamation, but were able to survive for an extended period of time due to the size of the organism, and that it could consume its own mass to extend its miserable existence. The pit slowly grew a flesh sack around the compound megacow, which scientists think were for the purpose of digesting it. The horns of this compound megacow consistently gore a hole into this sack, and to this day, the tear in the tissue lining, combined with the rhythmic suffering of the megacow, is known as the Peking Druid Geobiological Formation. I find it unfair that when I have a gaping wound, constantly leaking fluids, people vomit and pass out, but when the flesh pit does it, it's a tourist attraction. That's double standard. The Happy Meat Farm Genetic Modification Abomination Tier List. That's right, we've been blessed with this presentation of all these pained wallowing testaments to human scientific advancement, and I'm gonna put them on the internet rankings chart on how good they are. Now, some of you might ask what the scale of goodness is, and it's based entirely on my opinion. So let's get into it. Subject number C0172. Chicken, male, 31 days old. Status, alive. Results, skin aberrations, no sensory organs. Is this thing capable of eating? This thing has no sensory organs at all. So, I don't even know if it would experience anything in the first place. Does it even know if it's alive? Or is it just basically asleep forever? I envy this thing's existence, so Chicken Helen Keller gets S tier. Subject number M0097. Cow. Female. 15 months old. Status. Alive. Results. Enlarged udder. Full of tumors. That would be a lot of extra meat, so it does have that working for it. Although I'm not really sure tumor meat is very appetizing. Hold up a second. Okay, I just googled it and I can't find anyone who's tried to eat a tumor and it says it's illegal to sell animals with tumors, but maybe you could sell it on the discount on the down low, so this thing goes in D tier. Subject number P0112. Pig male, five months old. Status, alive. Results, lives despite no face. This pig looks like it was run through the deep dream generator. It lives, yet it doesn't have a face. Kind of reminds me of the chicken, but it looks like it has some sense organs. They're just arranged haphazardly. Since it's cognizant enough to know it's suffering, I'm gonna put it in C tier. Subject number M0098. Cow, female, 12 months old. Status, deceased. Results, died instantly. Developed stomach eye. This thing died instantly upon the development of an eyeball in its stomach. No reason you couldn't just sell that as a meat cow and cut out the eye and put the eye in a jar with some isopropyl to be like a neat little desk decoration to be a pretty approachable boss, you know? So it goes in B tier. Increasing treatment levels. I don't know what treatment levels mean, but whatever they were before, now they're more than that. We're getting into the fun stuff. Subject number P0113. Pig, female, three months old. Status, deceased. Results, looking at it causes extreme discomfort. And they censored it. <laughs> Wait, how did you- oh, that's not that bad. I've seen worse claim to be in the top 5% of OnlyFans creators. A tier. Subject number C0174. Looks like a coral reef made only out of chickens. It says unclear if alive. Couldn't you check its vitals? Wait. Where even would the heart be on this thing? For being a nugget, even before it is processed, this one gets beat here. Recommendation send to HR. What is HR gonna do about it? I know animals and chickens aren't usually predators. Subject number M0099. Cow, female, three months old. Status, alive. Results, developed extreme growth. I can't even tell where it ends and where it begins. It's just an endless pile of suffering meat made solely for the purpose of consumption. This says a lot about society. 
Society says a lot about this. F tier, stop judging me, stupid metaphor cow. Send it to HR? Another animal going to HR. I think we have different ideas about what HR is supposed to be. You know what time it is? It's time to take this monstrous exercise to the logical extreme. That's my favorite time. Increasing treatment levels. Subject number, P0114. Pig, male, two months old. Status, forced to terminate. Results, uncontrollable growth. Killed an employee. I'm confused as to what are considered uh, effective results. Like, is this thing for eating? Cause then, good job. Or maybe not? How does this thing even move enough to kill an employee? It looks like they took a JPEG of an obese man's stomach and copy pasted it a million times in Photoshop. And for that reason, I give it A tier. Send to HR. Wait, they just... They just said they killed it. Why are they sending a dead pig carpet to HR? Who is making these recommendations? What happens at HR? Subject number M0101. Cow, male, seven months old. Status, missing. Results, subject, escaped facility. That thing doesn't look like a cow. It looks like a spider or something. Okay, so we have like several eyes all around it. A bunch of what looks like limbs stemming from indiscernible body locations. Find it immediately. Whoever's making these recommendations definitely just sent it to HR and it just disappeared and they erased the previous order and wrote that in in a panic. I'm gonna put this guy at S tier because Alex Bale is making Spongebob videos again. Okay, so that is the full undebatable tier list as my opinion is fact. If you have any other incorrect opinions, I cannot stop you from leaving them in the comments below. I, I mean, I could, but I won't. YouTube might though, depending on what you say. The Happy Meat Farms Genetic Abomination Human Trials tier list. That's right, we've been blessed with this presentation of these pained wallowing quote unquote volunteers, and I'm gonna put them on the internet rankings chart on how good they are. Now, some might ask what the scale of goodness is, and it's based entirely on my opinion. So let's get into it. Subject number H0018, human male, 51 years old. Classification, volunteers. Results, deformed face, no significant growth. Straight out the gate, it's giving me major Frankenstein vibes. But if you're honest, you've been desperate enough to sleep with worse if no one would find out. C tier, honestly, I can't even judge you. Subject number, H0019, human male, 38 years old. Classification, volunteer. Results, contorted skin, no significant growth. That's more than contorted skin right there. That's like contorted everything. You know, a lot of people say that genetically modifying humans is wrong because of atrocities like this. And to that, I say, I once knew a genetically modified super genius. They advanced so quickly as a child that they were already in med school as a baby and they were in kindergarten as a sperm. Not to mention achieving all of this while their dad was in jail. B tier, I forget what we were talking about. I need to call my friend. Subject number H0020, human female, 35 years old. Classification, insubordinate employee. Results, completely liquefied. No significant growth. Oh, so they're just mutating anyone they don't like to the point of liquefaction? Uber Eats guy comes late and up your order? Boom, they're liquid. Partner cheats on you with another person? Boom, Rando's liquid. They come back to you apologetically and also eight months pregnant with his baby needing someone to care for both her and the baby? Boom, they're both liquid. F tier. I don't want to talk about it. Results are ineffective. Increasing treatment levels. Subject number H0021. Human male, 44 years old. Classification, volunteer. Results, lumpy. Slight growth. I love how the results just say lumpy. I mean, like, it's not wrong. Honestly, I'm having trouble coming up with describing it any other way. I hate this, it's heinous, but not bad enough to make you do coke out of your own anus C tier compared to what I've seen is nothing. Subject number H0022. Human, female, 41 years old. Classification, volunteer. Results, it's on the ceiling. Slight growth. Recommendation, get that thing down. Why would they need to get it down if it's on the ceiling? It's still in the cage. They just want to stifle its creativity and crush its soul. I'm sorry, I thought this was an unethical laboratory full of abominations, not an office. A tier, you can do whatever you put your mind to, buddy. Subject number, H0023. Human, male, 25 years old. Classification, outsider. Results, unclear. This one uh, literally just speaks for itself. B tier. Results are still ineffective. Increasing treatment levels. Subject number H0024. Human, male, 54 years old. Classification, non-compliant journalist. Results, unable to move. Significant growth. As a compliant non-journalist, I would like to say that this is all slanderous fiction. I am a hack. I'm a liar. I'm a fraud. Don't look at anything I make with artistic integrity because it is not there. Happy Meat Farms is an upstanding company that would never liquefy nor horribly mutate 
anyone for a small squabble such as human rights violations that didn't actually happen. F tier, should have kept his mouth shut. Send to HR. I mean like, okay, at least this time they're actual humans. Could be, uh, I get it. I, I don't really get it, but I get it more. Subject number H0025, human, male, 32 years old. Classification, insubordinate employee. Results, devoid of any human qualities. Significant growth. Ooh, it's pretty horrifying. It's uh, pretty horrifying. It says devoid of human traits, but this thing is pretty ugly, and ugly is definitely a human trait. Recommendation, send to HR. Yeah, you know, I'd be pretty traumatized too if that were me. D tier, do not let it touch me. Subject number H0027. Human, female, 47 years old. Classification, hosts. Result, extremely intelligent, extremely dangerous. Recommendation, we need better containers. Wait a minute, if the last one was H0025, and this one is H0027, where is H0026? <laughs> Oh yeah, that's right. Also, you lied to me. I thought I was gonna see a mutated, super intelligent metahuman, and all you have is an empty room and broken glass. You are a charlatan, this factory tour sucks, and I want my money back. You need better containers? No sh Sherlock. You also need better scientists and management. S tier. Can't blame you for wanting to leave this boring place. We should link in chat. I'm kind of peeved at your former employer, and I bet you are too. Mother will be bleed. Okay, so this is the full undebatable tier list, as my opinion is fact. If you have any other incorrect opinions, I cannot stop you from leaving them in the comments below my terrible cringy video. I mean, I can, but I won't. Probably. YouTube might though, depending on what you say. The Happy Meat Farms, a meat factory that's been genetically mutating animals and humans to the point of monstrosity for reasons that they won't tell me about willingly. Keyword, willingly. After numerous attempts of complex hacking strategies that it would be useless for a superior being such as myself to experience explain to your tiny human raisin brain, I finally cracked one of the most mysterious parts of the Happy Meat Farm. No, it's not HR, but I'm working on that. It's the research and development documents, and oh boy, is this some juicy stuff. Let's do a bit of light reading, shall we? Before we get into it, I have two other Happy Meat Farm videos that you should probably watch if you'd like to avoid being horrifically mutated, but hey, that's your prerogative, right? Welcome to the Happy Meat Farm's research and development department portal. We're so glad to have you on this highly coveted team. The R&D department is a team of trusted, extremely talented scientists discovering ways to push us closer to the new world order. The primary objective of the HMF R&D department is to provide the largest amount of living biomass to HR. Project Chimera was started as a way to use science to increase the potential of animal growth through advanced genome modification. Foreign DNA is provided by mother and inserted into the test subjects, yielding a variety of outcomes. After years of testing, we have managed to refine this process and greatly increase the biomass of the subjects, and we've even moved on to human trials. The subjects who survived the process display different physical abnormalities and contortions. In some cases, the subjects displayed aggressive behavior or increased intelligence. Thanks to our state-of-the-art containment rooms, we've had almost no subjects escape their captivity. Rest assured, all of the escaped subjects will be dealt with accordingly. Project Chimera is ongoing and yielding positive results for HR. Mother will be pleased. Over the years, Happy Meat Farms was linked to cases of different disease outbreaks across the world. While none of these links were publicly proven or processed, Executed, it nonetheless gave us the idea for Project Vulnerability. The R&D department created different meat products that could give consumers various different diseases. Rarely, these products were slipped into the market and consumers were heavily monitored. The goal of the project was to see how creating vulnerabilities in different members of the populace could prove to be useful in creating the new world order. The project found varying degrees of success. Subject, Arnold Burris, age 63. Subject consumed Happy Meat Farms chicken breast and developed type 1 diabetes. Yielded no useful results. I don't think that's no useful results. I mean, if the goal was to give him a disease, you definitely did it. Don't be so hard on yourself, buddy. I think you did a great job ruining that innocent man's health. Subject, Hugo Lawson, age 37. Subject consumed Happy Meat Farms thin cut ham and developed chronic kidney disease. Subject died nine months later and yielded no useful results. I guess I don't understand science at all, and I'm just stupid. So, I don't know what useful results are. I don't even know why I'm trying to encourage you anymore. Subject, Cecil Mayhew, age 56. 
Subject consumed Happy Meat Farms ground beef and developed pancreatic cancer. Indirectly yielded two promising hosts. This is interesting. The word host has come up before. It came up with that lady that escaped containment. So they're hosts, but what are they hosting? How many are being hosted? And why wasn't I invited? Just for excluding me from the flesh party, I'm gonna read all of your flesh chimera incident reports. Subject number C0079, female chicken, age 14 days. Subject developed small orifice that could spit an acidic substance that allowed it to escape containment and injure one employee. Subject was caught and terminated before it escaped HMF grounds. Two low-level employees witnessed the subject and were given mandatory therapy. No risk posed to HMF. People say spitters are quitters, but it takes some serious guts to try and escape Happy Meat Farms as a 14-day-old baby chicken. Subject number M0101. Male, bovine, age 7 months. Subject developed 11 appendages and an undetermined amount of eyes, described by employees as spider-like in its appearance and movement. Subject showed no signs of intelligence or cognitive abilities. In the process of transportation to HR, subject escaped and killed three employees. Whereabouts currently unknown. Minimal risk posed to HMF. I thought this one might have been Alex Bale's muse originally, but I guess I was wrong, because they say it's just a big dum dum spider cow. Subject number, age 00. 027, human female, age 47. Exact details about the subject's appearance are unclear. All the employees who directly witnessed it are dead and visual records of the subject have been destroyed by it. Subject is extremely dangerous and intelligent. Subject escaped through containment, glass, and killed 11 employees. While the subject did eventually escape the facility, they did not head towards the exit first. It managed to access several of the HMF secured data servers before escaping. The servers remain intact, but many files are missing. Thanks, girl. They made for a great video. Never say I don't do anything for the audience, Amoeba. I do when I need one. Whereabouts currently unknown. Massive risk poached the HMF. Oh, you got that right, buddy. She is pissed. Also, her whereabouts are currently unknown to you, but I have a feeling that isn't going to be the case much longer. Due to increasing efforts to keep R&D information confidential, many projects have been redacted from the online R&D portal. If a project you are involved with is not available here, please speak with your department head and access it on the internal servers. He's given me the silent treatment. Such a diva. We thank you for your continued efforts and discretion as a member of the HMF family. By the way, the dicks at Happy Meat Farm never refunded my flesh coin, so I'm going to be leaving all of their access code and all the other weird stuff that I found while doing some <clears throat> research in a pinned comment under the video so y'all can take a peek for yourself. If you find anything, get in contact with me immediately. You cross the line, Happy Meat Farms. I was cool with you horribly mutating animals. I was fine with you feeding their meat to people to give them diseases because that's a hilarious prank and horribly mutating the humans after was the icing on the cake. Credit where credit is due. But you took a small amount of money from me and didn't give it back after fully fulfilling the service you advertised. And I won't take that lying down. The Happy Meat Farms HR Orientation Video Analysis. That's right, we've been blessed with a tour of the human resource facilities of this monument to genetic abominations, and I'm about to plunge your eye holes face first into this body horror extravaganza. So let's get into it. There is one job at HR, to feed mother. They receive assets from research and development and carefully transport them to mother. These assets are apparently sedated and cannot harm you like they harmed all those other employees. Before we ransack the human resources department, they have three rules. Rule one, don't touch anything. Rule two, don't look at anything. And rule three, have have fun! Now that we know the rules, let's go touch and look at everything while not enjoying ourselves the whole time. This is the whole room, filled with holes, for reasons. You can use any hole but this one. Keep your grubby hands off my wife. This is the hair room. It's filled with hair. And this is the flesh room, filled with real- wait a minute. Oh no. This building is alive, and I've been f***ing it! The rat room. There's a rat in here somewhere. Yeah, now there's two, buddy. Just wait until the health inspector sees this. You're done. I finally have some dirt on you that can take you down. The room with the yellow balloon. Don't go in there. Why, what happens when I go in So many fingers inside of me, everywhere! Are you having fun yet? The bathrooms? What is this, a crossover episode? Okay, but seriously, this is kind of problematic for multiple reasons. One, just the state of the toilets, but two, you went in there and took a, a photo of another employee's feces. I don't know if that's a crime, per se, but it's, it's definitely sussy as hell, per se. See, usually I'd ask HR these kind of questions, but this company seems to work a bit differently. This is the butterfly room. It says not to let them out. 
so I'm gonna let them out. This is the drawing room. It's fun. I know a human who loves drawing. Well, not so much love as much I make them draw for the show while holding a gun to their balls. This is the horse room, and apparently he is fine. I don't believe that, nor do I care enough to investigate. The pink room. Cool. When we slow it down, we see that it says, how did they get the detail right? Looks like a girl's childhood bedroom. Weird. This is the cow room. Feel free to take a snack. You know, that's a class act. I think I will. Thank you. Just for that, I'm gonna throw all my evidence away in the big old trash can. This is the birthday room. Happy birthday. <laughs> The next area is just a bit damaged as an escaped asset ran through here like an irradiated bull in a genetic china shop. This area has lots of puppies to befriend though. Feel free to pet them, except for this one. This one's in timeout for what he did to that guy's bones. They have a ton of mother's DNA on file too. You thinking what I'm thinking? No, well, yes, but no, I'm taking this. Now we're at the IT department. It's where Jared works. We don't talk to Jared because of he's a killer robot and also what happened with the fast food sandwich restaurant and all those kids. Apparently they can't show us that or that or them but that's okay cuz we've arrived are you ready to feed mother <laughs> this is way better than the last company I pretended to work at slash burglarized it's not me. it's not me I don't know who the hell you are lady he go on some people corner folk what are corner folk. If you saw small milky humanoids interdimensionally traveling in the corners of your home, would you grab the camera to calmly make a narrated educational video about them? Why are so many interdimensional gateways at some guy named Riley's house? What is the corner world? And why do the corner folk put short people in jail? Stay tuned to find out right now. The corner folk were first reported by a man named Riley Tillen. We know about Riley's documentation because of one Alex Kansas, the same human who documented the monument mythos. I will be linking to their work in the description. Alex's first video about the corner folk is a compilation of four videos uploaded by Riley, three of which in 2011 and one of which in 2013. The first of the four videos opens with Riley matter-of-factly explaining how there are multiple different dimensions and they all intersect with our own. These intersections are called corners. Most entities from one dimension are locked within their own dimension and cannot perceive entities living in other dimensions even when at a corner. Can't imagine how it feels to be that limited in experience. Anyways, beings worth a damn like the corner folk are able to pass through the corners and travel between dimensions. I think the name corner folk is a bit derivative. That would be like if I called you cell phone ape. Because of this ability, corner folk are considered a trans-dimensional species. Can I say, so happy to see trans-dimensional species representation in the media. Apparently, the corners of Riley's home just happened to line up with some key corners for dimensional transit. Because of this, the creamy corner folk like to curl up in the corners of Riley's house while he's not around and exhibit micro movements similar to that of dreaming animals. We can see in the following clip what it looks like when corner folk travel through Riley's house because I stole his iPhone and got this footage in addition to his nudes. So we know that they're jumping dimensions, but why are they doing it? Riley thinks that the corner folk might only leave their dimension for food, like humans only leave the house for resources. If you only leave your house for the bare minimum resources to survive, I'm ashamed to say that I can relate. The little corner folk have patterns on their skin, imprinted there from being haphazardly crammed into nurseries slash prisons in the corner world made out of corners to secure slash trap the infants. If you're quick to judge the corner folk for putting their youth in jail, just remember high school, and then remember how annoying you were in high school. They were right to put you in there. Riley thinks that the corners in his house are being used as in-between points for dimensional travel, like a rest stop. I mean, he's kinda right, but only in the fact that everyone pees there. After a while of this crap, Riley began to fixate on a dimension known as the corner world. The corner world is a world made up of a bunch of trans-dimensional intersections that's far too complex for your human brain to understand, so we just said fuck it, here's a bunch of lines. Anyways, Riley 
starts dreaming about the corner world, and like any rational being, he stays inside for weeks to obsessively draw what haunts his slumber. He begins to claim that the corner folk are taunting him, and no sh dude, they can travel dimensions and you don't even leave your house. He then says that he wants to enter the corner world, and he is not afraid of what happens to him when he does. Riley then jumps into a corner of his house and we get a look into the corner world. Imagine being so dumb, you try to film a dimension made of dimensions with a third dimensional camera. After a mental health and wellness check was called in cause someone saw that video, authorities discovered Riley asleep in a corner, his internal organs folded across various axes. He somehow survived his intestines being turned into origami, and he made origami his whole recovery despite never having been taught it. So what does this mean? Well for one, Riley's a nut job who talks like he put acid tabs in his cereal regardless of whether or not the corner folk are real. It also means we have to figure out what the corner folk want and what the hell they are in the first place. Corner folk. Corner baby? Corner girl? Corner pedophile? Are these trans-dimensional creatures murdering infants and then cramming them into the front windows of admittedly fuel-efficient vehicles? How can a human being possibly enter the corner world and come out unfolded? Who is the corner girl, and can she be saved? And what do corner folk taste like? Find out this time on In The Corner. If you haven't seen my first video on the corner folk, you should definitely go watch it. It explains one man's experience documenting them as well as other trans transdimensional phenomena taking place in the corners of his home. If you don't watch it, you'll probably be really confused, and I will trap you inside of the corner world. The corner folk were first reported by a man named Riley Tillen, who documented them using his home as a sort of rest stop for interdimensional travel, and then tried to enter the corner world, which is a dimension made of other dimensions intersecting. And then all of his organs turned into anatomy origami, and he was never the same. Got it? Good. We know about Riley's documentation because of one Alex Kansas, the same human who documented the monument mythos. I will be linking to their work in the description. Now without further ado, let's get into the most anticipated animated event since Pokemon 3 Michael Vick Returns, Corner Folk 2. The next video in the Corner Folk series is Corner Baby. Unlike the first Corner Folk video, it doesn't star our boy Riley Tillin, it stars the man, the myth, the legend, Alex Kansas himself. It details a crew building a set in an abandoned nursery. Despite taking place on September 21st, 2021, the video starts with music that reminds me of a 2014 life hack video. The nursery is pretty decrepit, as most of its windows have have been shattered. Anyways, during the four hours of mind-numbing painting that it took to create the set, somebody pulled up in a car and parked it near Alex and his squad. Now, I have already found something suspicious about this video. It claims to be taking place in 2021, but right here they are seen bottle flipping. This must mean one of two things. A, the video date is incorrect, or B, that's pretty cringe. Anyways, shortly after Alex's stint of being way too focused on someone doing a bottle flip, he's told to come outside by his friend who has purportedly found something disturbing. What? Um. What is it? No, no, no. You don't want to. Why? What? Do you want to come see me? Why? Is there someone outside? No, um. So I might be saying things, but I'm not sure exactly what's going on in this car. What? Where am I looking at? Next to the rear view window. Rear view, rear view mirror. Okay, if that thing is a baby, it's either incredibly deflated, or someone has dropped it headfirst on the ground from at least the height of a truck bed. So, Alex called the police immediately, who said it wasn't the first time they broke windows to recover children. Why didn't they specify car windows? Are they just like breaking into kids' rooms through their windows to quote unquote recover them at night? Side note, the upbeat music stops here, but I think the part about the possibly dead kid would be much funnier if they kept the track rolling. Then we're shown pictures of a demo site where we are told the nursery doesn't exist anymore. No mention as to whether or not the kid still exists. Actually, this one cop got really defensive when we found it strange that a dead baby needs to go in the evidence locker, but we're here to talk about the corner folk. So, what does this have to do with the corner folk? I don't f- <laughs> 
fucking know. Well, since the corner folks travel locations are usually in corners in the real world, and that baby was crammed really hard into the corner of a car window and seemingly left there folded like a pretzel, I'd be willing to bet a decent amount of corner cash that we already know our culprit in the baby car corner catastrophe. The next video in this series is Corner Girl, and if you think calling this series an analog horror was a stretch because it wasn't that scary, I'm happy to say you can put those non-fears to rest. Corner Girl opens with grainy footage of what is either an unconscious female or a corpse, and what sounds like audio from an educational video teaching children's about the amount of corners in different shapes. Text flashes on the bottom claiming that the person behind the camera is not Alex Kansas, and that he just moves luggage, and that Alex based Riley Tillen on him. She was luggage. You are luggage too. Luggage is so easy to lose. <laughs> Sincerely, Alex's inspiration. So what does this mean? There's obviously a lot of questions unanswered, but I think enough information is there to flesh out the world slightly more. First of all, we know that regular humans are indeed able to enter the corner world without being folded into oblivion. We also know that the corner world is being used for some form of human trafficking. Whether or not Alex's inspiration is using the corner world as a rest stop to move people from point A to point B in our world, or is just storing them in the corner world for some probably horrific purpose is yet unknown. This info also brings into the question, what the corner people are. It could be possible that after prolonged exposure to the corner world, one would become so folded that they would somehow resemble a corner folk, which doesn't make any sense, but shut up. This is just a theory, but it's possible that whoever Riley is based on is leaving people in corner prisons until they become corner folk themselves. Why? I don't know. I'm like half sure that I'm completely wrong anyways because there's not enough info to- so if I know if I'm accurate. Humans will believe anything you tell them. Their brain is as smooth as a Ken doll's cry. The Monument Mythos. Why was there a lady locked immobile in the Lincoln Monument for four to eight years depending on re-election? Is this some weird fetish shit? What the hell is wrong with this tree? Where did this giant nuclear crab come from? And what would happen if James Dean were actually real? Stay tuned to find out right now. The Monument Mythos was first discovered on a channel called Alex Kansas. It documents how your government communicates and engages with Lovecraftian phenomena and beings to manipulate the reality humans exist in every day. These beings are often contained within important United States monuments. It does a great job documenting this phenomena in a beautiful analog horror fashion, giving me a raging nostalgia fear erection. And I'll be linking to their work in the description. Without further ado, let's take a look at this delightfully nightmarish distortion of US history. Let's talk about special trees. Special trees are both in Egypt and America, and no one will tell me where they come from. They can't be cut down in a traditional sense, so people will harm them to attempt to stop their growth by making the trees focus on healing themselves. You keep working, buddy. I believe in you. People will also build towers around these trees to limit their growth. For example, the Washington Monument was constructed to contain a special tree. They seem to display some semblance of intelligence, although this is not consistent amongst the trees. For example, the tree in the Washington Monument uses music to lure victims inside the tower where it raises them up to the top of the tower and drops them to their death. Over 20 individuals have gone missing during visiting the Washington Monument, and by gone missing, we both know that I mean they turned into a bright red stain. Not only this, there is some limited evidence that these trees are capable of teleportation and manifesting in towering human forms. Sometimes lightning will spring from these trees, turning what it strikes into a material known as Giza glass, an incredibly durable material with otherworldly properties that can be fashioned into a razor-sharp blade. Any limb severed from a living being is still still fully under the control of that being when severed with Giza glass. Unfortunately, all products containing Giza glass had to be pulled from shelves when some pervert ruined it for everyone when he cut out his eyes, hands, and tongue and left them in several movie theater bathrooms. Giza glass can also turn people's decapitated heads into crowns when they are decapitated, which are basically just like floating living heads. Also President Rockefeller, who was totally a president and not an oil tycoon, just shut up and go with this, so he cut off a lot of felons' heads and sold them to Germany as slaves 
slave labor that they used to create an airship that killed a lot of Americans. What the hell are we talking about again? President Rockefeller saw one of these trees and he was like, oh, horrendous. So with a level of carelessness on par with wiping your ass after applying Icy Hot without washing your hands first, he decided to dig up the tree and glue a bunch of branches to it rather than just get in the regular Crimbus tree. He put it into the I name stuff after myself because I'm super secure center so everyone could marvel at it. Apparently they are links between universes as shown by that one little girl who put a star on top of Rockefellers and the tree decided to put her into another dimension as one does. Don't ask me to explain literally any of what I just said because I'm just as lost as you are. Have you heard about the Lincoln lookers? You better make sure you aren't disliked by any presidents because one woman Maya Arnoldson didn't do anything except slightly resemble someone who did and she was kidnapped, immobilized, and crammed into a metal statue shaped like the Emancipator with only two small eye holes for two weeks. She was in fact the wrong person and got a personal apology from Ronald Reagan. Please give me access to the presidential health care. My bones and muscles have atrophied from being unable to move. How long are you going to hold this over my head? I already said sorry. We can get an inside look at how these Lincoln lookers are chosen from a quote from important government man. There's always got someone that we dislike more than everyone else. Not usually famous or important, but you've done something that's affected us personally. Often you're the, you know, the only person who remembers this act. But I've been that bad, but memory hurts. Everyone experiences this, and the president is no exception. Except he can do something about it. Every president can choose one person to be a Lincoln looker. After the alibi is fabricated, the person is abducted from their home, and they stay a Lincoln looker for as long as the president sits in office. Nobody can question his decision, and it's no trial. You might be surprised, but nothing new. It's been a tradition. Lincoln lookers have been around for a very long time. People thought that the victims of Lincoln lookers were imprisoned behind presidential portraits, and they took the portraits off the wall to prove that they weren't. Well, no one behind the painting. I guess I owe you an apology. Lousy plumbing systems. <laughs> we gotta get that checked. Ever visit the Kennedy Memorial Cocaine Lounge? I bet it's not behind the portraits, though. I think either the Lincoln Lookers or some other eldritch abomination is in the monument, because one time some blind girl heard scratching noises coming from inside of it. Wait, or was she deaf? Whatever, same thing, doesn't matter. I've had a lot of hate going around, likely deservedly, because I'm an asshole. But to those folks, I'm putting up a pawn for office in 2024, so if being crammed in a statue and fed through a tube for four to eight years depending on the governing and campaigning strategies of the crackhead I found outside Wendy's doesn't sound like a vibe. It's time to have a nice steaming cup of shut the f up. In this world, these symbols of national pride that were created to represent our nation's histories as upstanding achievements are hollow. Inside of them lives a dark force being manipulated by people with power. Be it power in the military, power in the media, or power in the economy. I can identify with this series a lot. When the guy who wrote my terrible jokes was a kid, he was told that pilgrims and Native Americans were friends, and that bread was good for you. And look what happened to him. He got fat and stupid. Monument Mythos is a long, masterful series that I would like to cover with a series of my own rather than one big video to really give it the attention it deserves. If you think that I could possibly make a video about the amount of times that the government has lied to you about something of eldritch importance. Leave now and protect your innocence, because like every girl I've ever met, this channel will make it go far, far away. Sometimes I regret ad-libbing in the script because I don't think before I talk. I still don't even know what to make of the nuclear cargo ship monster crab George Washington. Planets. Observer 4 probe findings explained. That's right, we've been blessed with evidence detailing extraterrestrial life, and I'm going to be putting this info into context so your human brain can more easily understand it. So let's get into it. Planets is an analog horror detail detailing the 48-year expedition of the Observer 4 space probe as well as the evidence of extraterrestrial life and strange astrological phenomena found during the journey. The Observer 4 was launched in 2038 and recovered in 2086, and the data inside the probe was shocking to say the least. I know what you're thinking, how is it analog horror if it takes place in the future? And the answer is shut the f*** up! We know about these planets because of one YouTube channel run by a fish by the name of Black Dragonfish. I'll be linking to their findings below. At first, all seems routine for the Observer 4 as it approaches a neighboring solar system, snapping some candid pics of some asteroids as it passes. It examines some normal enough seeming planets and their moons, but after a moment the mood seems to slowly but surely darken, foreshadowing that something might not be quite right with the Observer 4. One of the first indications that the Observer 4 probe is acting strangely is when it approaches the planet Horus. Horus is noted as an inhospitable ice planet that has a quote-unquote face 
that is used for experiments. My question is, how would humans be able to determine that Horus is used for experiments if they literally just discovered it this moment using this probe? Did you guess? Unless I'm missing something, it seems like someone or something else is adding information that it would be impossible for humanity to know based on its current circumstances. The next planet that Observer 4 comes across is Helios. Helios is unique as its moons are alive. I'm not sure if this means the moons themselves are alive or they just contain biological ecosystems. The language feels intentionally vague. There's something missing here. So if this guy is anything like me, he doesn't know either. Tartarus, named for the Greek mythology's version of hell, is the most unique of the moons as it is the most organic in nature, with more biodiversity than the food in the back of the fridge that no one's quite sure what it used to be. The probe describes it as a wandering, quietly weeping gateway. Can't shake the feeling that it's in some way related to its name. Keeping up with the hell naming scheme, the next planet the observer approaches is Baphomet, named for goat f***er over here. The planet is as black as coal and a terrifying nightmare, as opposed to a not terrifying nightmare. The next planet, Anuket, named for the Nile goddess, is described as a water world. Just like Earth, its oceans are home to yet undiscovered, unimaginable horrors. It has many moons, but none have been photographed. I'm not sure if they just couldn't find it, or the observer just got lazy, but all I know is what's in this space probe that I stole, so we're moving on. The most significant and concerning media that the probe contains is about the world of Hathor. Hathor, home, a second Earth, life. Isn't it beautiful? Interloper, we're watching. Satan, moon of Hathor. You found new life. Isn't this what you wanted? May 31st, 2075. Observer 4 loses connection. October 24th, 2075. Connection is regained. February 4th, 2086. Observer approaches Earth. Recovered by yours truly. If you don't know much about space travel, I can't blame you because your species mostly uses its technology to spike dopamine. Mandatory species sensitivity training says you can't blame people for what they're born into, but any idiot can see this is not regular space probe protocol. This craft lost connection with Earth, then regained connection already en route back to the human homeworld. The thing is, humans wouldn't be able to reprogram it to come back if they lost connections with the probe. We know that the probe doesn't return to Earth as a failsafe for lost connections because it didn't do so when it lost connection previously. That means that something else must have intercepted it, reprogrammed it, and tampered with its data, leaving messages. Seemingly threatening warning messages. With the flashing word of home on Hathor and the fact that this was the last world it visited before it lost connection and was rerouted back to Earth, it seems like whatever message with your little probe here was native to Hathor. They also seem to know a bit about you guys, as they're really layering in the satanic imagery and names because they know it freaks y'all out. Those threats sound like they are coming from someone who feels that they are backed in a corner. Now to a human brain, that might sound like you have the upper hand, and you might, but nothing bites harder, faster, and with less abandon than a snarling dog backed into a corner. My advice, find another exoplanet. They obviously do not want to be friends with benefits, and after the millionth open an R, you just gotta take the L. Omega Mart. This week at Omega Mart, save on gestating mammal liquid, just $4.75. Gestating mammal liquid toast paint, only $5.99. Gestating mammal liquid with added bacteria, now two for $10. Plus, save on aged gestating mammal liquid in block form. That's good news for my brittle bones. That's Omega Mart. Oh, 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 Omega Mart. You have no idea what's in store for you. If you've been looking around the internet recently, you've probably heard of Omega Mart. Omega Mart is an art installation attached to what could possibly be an ARG type story from the team Meow Wolf. Omega Mart seems to be a grocery store with several unusual properties. Just a totally normal supermarket in Las Vegas. The world's friendliest free range staff. Omega Mart has a strange comedy Uncanny Valley vibe to it. Both comedic and off in a way that's strangely alluring and sometimes unsettling, a lot of these products seem like something that would be from another dimension made up by an alien. And save on individually wrapped wheat squares. Something familiar with human habits and mannerisms, but also gives themselves away in pretty obvious ways. Romantic dinner in a can. Spoil your special someone. That's true love. That's Omega Mart. It seems like it's trying really hard to be a supermarket, and it just can't get it right. Looking to go shopping? Root beer flavored vape juice flavored root beer. Power Wings multi-purpose formula. Also, what the hell is up with the citrus products from this place? Have you tried Omega Mart brand orange drink? If you or a loved one answered yes, please call Omega Mart Consumer Affairs immediately at 1-800-808-4194. That's 1-800-808-4194.
$41.94. It seems like everything related to a citrus fruit in the Omega Mart line of merchandise gets recalled. This is an important message for customers who have recently purchased Omega Mart lemons. Some customers have confused Omega Mart lemons with lemons. Please return this product to Omega Mart immediately. For your safety, this product has been removed from our shelves and will be carefully disposed of. I don't know if it's just me, but in art pieces, sometimes recurring symbols and events mean something. Apparently, some of the products at Omega Mart are more than meets the eye. Terrible cliche pun not intended because I like to think I'm not a hack. Upon calling your local Omega Mart to return this dangerous yet delicious merchandise, you would receive this message. Thank you for calling Omega Mart, the number one supermarket in the world. If you're calling about Omega Mart lemons, press one. If, you're, if you or a loved one has been recently exposed to Omega Mart brand lemons, please return them to your local Omega Mart store or dispose of them safely in a lead container buried a minimum of five feet below the ground and three miles from any known water source. Use of earplugs is strongly advised. Omega Mart thanks you for your continued trust. All of this media raises a lot of questions, especially because Omega Mart is a real place. Apparently, this is just the latest iteration in an experiential art piece with installments spanning back to 2009. The original experience was much more of a joke, apparently having a much lower production value with props that fooled very little people. It required quite a bit more suspension of disbelief. In the second version, the team behind Omega Mart marketed it as a real grocery store. They even took out attack ads against themselves in the local newspaper. The grand opening had artists dressed like employees, fake protesters planted outside by the team, and it seemed like the town was buying it. Some people even came by and applied for jobs. They said it was an art piece and that they weren't hiring, but some people left their resumes anyway. If I worked there, I would hire them just to mess with them to add to the performance part of the Omega Mart experience. The third version is the market associated with the commercials we've just seen today. It's located in Area 15 in Las Vegas. Vegas. Apparently the place is a sprawling grocery store with secret entrances and tunnels everywhere. I'm guessing whatever's inside could give us some answers relating to the strange ad. But if their marketing is any good, you'll see way more questions than answers so you'll want to come back. Omega Mart, if this is the case, no one can blame you. And if this isn't the case, you should be doing this. Omega Mart commercials are still being uploaded weekly on the Meow Wolf page, so this series is very much still alive. I don't think it can be solved yet. I think we're gonna see some more cool unexpected stuff from Meow Wolf and Omega Mart that would make any theories that I would make up just look stupid. Some of you might be wondering, is Omega Mart all just a weird marketing campaign for the sake of memorable product placement to get your smooth customer brain to buy more crap? And to that accusation I say, now for a brief word from our sponsor. Attention shoppers, on sale at Amoeba Mart, half off for rectal use only hand sanitizers. Plus, save on non-alcoholic baby food. Show off your flair with ready-to-carve boneless street pumpkins. Feeling lucky? Try your luck with Schrodinger's eggs. They both are and aren't half price until you open them. Hurry, at these prices, they both will and won't last until you check. Unfortunately, I am not able to travel to Area 15 in Vegas because I'm just a voice actor being held hostage by an eyeball creature. That's okay though, because the eyeball creature told me that Omega Mart has a website where you can take home just a little bit of that Omega Mart magic for yourself in your own home. With products like Tattoo Chicken, Vegan Goat Pus Lemonade, and Who Told You This Was Butter Air Freshener Spray. Remember, Mr. Omega says shopping every day increases brain smile. For for some reason, one of the most dangerous and powerful creatures in the entire Lovecraft mythos goes unmentioned in almost every piece of media I see about him. This abomination is so powerful that even though it died almost 100 years ago, uttering its name can still destroy the career of any online creator. This creature is, of course, H.P. Lovecraft's cat. Even though a lot of Lovecraft's discriminatory ideology aged like spilled yogurt in a Florida parking lot, the monsters and some of the philosophy behind them are still pretty cool. Visualization of Lovecraft monsters is hard because many of them drive you completely mad when you look at them, but this art style is too goofy to scare anyone, and I'm already insane, so I think we'll be safe. First up is the Dunwich Horror. The Dunwich Horror was born from a human woman and a great old one by the name of Yog sothoth Yog sothoth is a mass of glowing orbs covered in eyes and writhing with an uncountable amount of tendrils, some of which were, you know, most likely inside of an incredibly disturbed human woman. Unless you have a better idea of how these two did the deed. I mean, what other part of it would even go inside of where is beyond me? Anyways, the Dunwich Horror usually chooses to remain invisible. It can show itself, but when humans 
Dunwich look upon the Dunwich Horror, they go completely insane. The Dunwich Horror is described as a monster around the size of a barn that's dotted with red eyes. It has many tentacles extending from its body, each ending in a mouth that contains razor-sharp teeth. It has a vaguely human-like face with a large mouth also overflowing with dagger-like teeth. It exudes a nauseating stench and survives by draining cows of their blood before devouring them. Now this creature might be terrifying and it might smell terrible and also maybe it devours entire swarms of cattle in a series of seconds and sure it might drive you literally insane if you look at it from how horrifyingly disgusting it is but i put up with lots of humans who have the exact same problems i think the dunwich horror gets a bad rap i mean sure it's a harmful monstrosity but it never asked to exist on earth if we are to blame anyone for this it is the family who encouraged the woman who watched too many naughty tentacle animes to act out her unholy urges in real life with an eldritch abomination if the mother smoked, drank, and did lines of Colombian white during the pregnancy, you don't blame the baby for being a little bit off. I don't know, maybe that's a bad example. The story of the Dunwich Horror is actually quite tragic. Before the creature's death, its last words were a cry from help from its extraterrestrial father to be saved from a place with people that didn't understand it and punished it because of that. Who's the real barn-sized, horrible-smelling, cattle-devouring, tentacle-covered monstrosity? Now you just think about that. Well, that's pretty depressing, so let's lighten the mood with something really weird. Next on the list are the Children of the Sphinx. The Children of the Sphinx look like humans that have been Frankenstein together with different animals, appearing often as a human with an animal head. They are created from human and animal mummies being mixed and matched like bionicles before being affected by a very powerful magic called Suspension of Disbelief, which reanimated them. These abominations worship the Sphinx, and that's pretty much the sum of what they do with their existence. Fun fact, the creation of the Children of the Sphinx was partially attributed to Harry Houdini, the legendary escape artist that could escape anything but his own appendix. No, I don't think it was too soon, it was almost a hundred years ago. This is Yagalanak the Defiler. Yagalanak's day job is being the god of perversion and depravity. It is a sadistic old one that enjoys making humanity suffer. This old one is from an unknown ruin in an unknown place. While it doesn't always have a physical form, it for some reason chooses to manifest as a morbidly obese mass of a man with no head and mouths with long tongues in each palm. So, uh, you know. What that mouth do? I'm cringing too, but you, like, come on, you can't not make that joke. When summoned, he either offers a job to the summoner to be one of his evil priests, or just consumes them as food. Yagolanak often looks for people who read perverse and forbidden literature to become his servants. So if this monstrosity kept up with the times and got into other media as it developed, I'll see you degenerates in his army. Next up is the great race of Yilth. This this alien species is capable of projecting their consciousness across space and time, and they can even swap minds with members of their own species and steal the bodies of other species. If humanity had this ability, I guarantee all people would be doing would be playing musical chairs with each other's bodies to do disturbing things with each other's bits, and nothing would get done. This isn't a problem for the Yilth though, because they reproduce with seeds that grow into another Yilth when in contact with water. Their original forms are unknown, and at some point they swapped bodies with this species species that was on prehistoric Earth, and created a huge civilization governed under what is described as fascistic socialism on the planet. They were eventually forced to project their minds into an insectoid species to avoid being wiped out by the next monstrosity on our list, the flying polyps. The polyps are very mysterious, because the records kept by the Yilth only told us how icky and scary they are, but for some reason they didn't describe their physiology very well. They are described as polyps, which are like a kind of sea anemone, so I guess they're like a flying Flying, evil, tenderly, fleshy, mouthy, eyeball-y sea anemone? I could say how they look quite phallic, but that's kind of a low-hanging fruit. While they can fly, they don't show any wings or any other body parts that would typically allow a creature to get in the air, and they leave many five-toed radial footprints wherever they go. Next up is Lukathu. Lukathu is a planet-sized sphere made entirely from organs. It's quite moist and covered in these weird warty postals. Apparently, every one of these tiny postals is a gestation chamber that's developed developing a baby old one. I know old one just means being of a great power from an ancient source in this mythos, but the words baby old one just makes me imagine a really wrinkly old man baby. Most often when one thinks of a fertility god, they think of Aphrodite, but Lovecraft's idea of symbolizing fertility is a giant insectoid-esque egg sac. 
it's kind of common knowledge that he projected himself into his work, so like, I'm really really curious what Lovecraft was into, like, what got his motor running, like, what made his cream expel at great speed out of his cup. The next entity is possibly the most abstract of all of the abominations in the Lovecraftian mythos. It is the blackness between the stars itself, a literal conscious nothingness that observes all of the universe with a sense of cold indifference. This being rarely chooses to communicate, but when it does, does communicate, it speaks in a language only it can comprehend. I know what you're thinking, as did you only cover this one because you could draw it just by using one color and a paint bucket tool? Now that's not the only reason, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't one of them. I couldn't make something on Lovecraft without mentioning the face of the mythos, so let's talk about Cthulhu. Cthulhu is often described as an unholy amalgamation of human, dragon, and octopus. This lumbering beast is said to be the size of a mountain. Cthulhu is currently in a deep sleep at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, and he dreams of the day that he will awake to subjugate all of humanity. That's some big goals, Squiddy. You can't fault this guy. He's just a boy with a dream, damn it. He has an incredibly devoted and extensive cult of followers that devote their lives to bringing about his awakening. He's even run for office in multiple satirical political campaigns. Needless to say, he is someone who I aspire to be like one day and take great inspiration from. Lovecraft encouraged people to collaborate and add to his mythos, so while some of these creatures may have been created by Lovecraft himself, a good amount of them were from other authors who contributed. In that spirit, I would like to add my own creature to the mythos. In the spirit of Lovecraft, I'm gonna make it unpronounceable, and if you want, you can decide on spelling on your own, because I, I don't care. This is- And it is the love child of Yagalanak the Defiler and H.P. Lovecraft's cat. It is an overweight neck beard with anime cat girl ears and a tail that spends its day on internet message boards making jokes about things that I would get cancelled just for mentioning in this context. Well, I was deciding between that and a large consistently growing mass of still living and conscious organisms that have had their flesh, skin, and organs fused together, trapping them as one large being from going from planet to planet, absorbing all living creatures into its own mass growing exponentially and therefore needing more to feed it. It has its own consciousness, and it also has access to all of the nervous systems of all of the beings it assimilates into its own mass. So it tortures them with their greatest fears playing out on repeat while it slowly dissolves their physical form into a million other alien beings over eternity. Yeah, so that's definitely a tie. I, I can't think of which is more horrifying from these two. Okay, medieval folklore fight. A monopod, which is like a big foot guy, not like a big foot guy, nor like a big foot guy, but like a guy with one big foot, versus a blemies, which is like a torso face man. See, for me it could go either way because they both look equally terribly designed. Let's take a look at some other folklore monsters that are less stupid. First up is the Wendigo. The Wendigo is created when a person eats human flesh. This legendary Native American entity is cursed to lurk through the forest looking for people to eat, and like the average corporate customer, it will consume anything it comes across in vain attempts to satisfy its endless hunger. The Wendigo resembles an emaciated human skeletal figure with skin tightly encasing its bones. Its complexion is that of ash, and it's reported to have sunken dark eyes. The Wendigo has no lips, as they usually immediately bite them off off to sate their unending hunger. Like a member of r slash incels, you'll know if one of these beasties is nearby because this creature exudes a stench of decomposition and decay. Obviously, this myth was created as a way of dissuading people from eating each other. A lot of people mistakenly think that the Wendigo and Skinwalker are the same thing, but they're not only wrong, but also insensitive. A Skinwalker is a different entity from Native American legend that is created from the spirit of a shaman or a witch doctor who committed evil deeds during their lifetime. especially to those close to them. It's rumored that simply discussing the skinwalker will attract their attention. And if that's the case, thanks for the extra views, and maybe, you know, drop me a like for shouting you out. The skinwalker often appears as a mangled and distorted form of an animal, or sometimes a human. It's capable of replicating animal calls and human voices, but it has a very limited vocabulary. Skinwalkers have to learn how to inhabit the skin of another convincingly. The more experienced the skinwalker, the better the disguise. One second. 
Hello, neighbor who lives across the street from me. As you can see, I still have the same skin that I did this morning, upright posture, and I speak words. So it's safe to say that I'm still a normal human being like I was earlier today. Now that I have established that I am not a monster wearing your neighbor's skin, may I come in for a cup of sandwich and you go to bed immediately with no suspicion and also without checking if I have left? What do you mean I'm wearing your neighbor's skin? That's ridiculous! That's not even my neighbor! Next up is the Kune Kune, an urban legend from Japan. The Kune Kune is basically one of those wacky wavable inflatable arm flailing tube men at those car dealerships, except this one causes extreme and debilitating mental illness. The Kune Kune is a humanoid figure that waves in the wind like it's made out of paper. The Kune Kune is reported to only be seen from afar. People usually report seeing this entity from a distance in rice fields, open plains, or sometimes the ocean. It waves around like it's being pushed by the wind, even if there is no wind, and it bends in ways that no ordinary human limbs could replicate. It is either stark white or jet black, depending on where you see it. Reports of the Kune Kune usually go as follows. A person sees a figure off in the distance and someone takes a closer look. The person who takes a closer look becomes pale and begins to develop signs of serious mental illness. The first report of the Kune Kune came in 2003, and people have been sharing their stories about this entity ever since. Some people suspect that the Kune Kune was a scarecrow that was misidentified on a windy day. While this would explain the movement of the figure, it would not explain the mental illness that follows. I mean, I look at scarecrows pretty closely all the time, and I'd say I'm pretty well adjusted. Actually, maybe we should stop looking at scarecrows so closely. Next up is the Knuckle of V. The Knuckle of V is an evil sea spirit native to Scotland. The Knuckle of V is a horse with a humanoid torso and head sticking out of the back of the horse where a person would usually be riding. The horse and the human are fused as one singular being. The being has no skin, and the outside of the body is covered in raw exposed muscle fiber, and you can see black blood coursing through its veins. The humanoid head has an animal-like mouth, and sometimes rolls or hangs like the neck is snapped and the head may fall off. The arms of the humanoid section of the torso are so long that they almost drag along the ground. The horse has one giant red eye and flippers on its feet. Basically, the Knuckle of V is the platypus of the Scottish folklore scene. This folklore was then stolen by the SCP Foundation to write SCP-3456, the Arcadian Horseman. If the Knuckle of V sees something, it will do everything it can to make it commit the not alive. And also, it likes to light crops on fire. There's a famous quote referencing this creature as the most cruel and malignant of all uncanny beings that trouble mankind. Even though this thing is from the ocean, it has an incredible fear of fresh water, and it never visits when it rains. Seems kinda dumb that something from the ocean is afraid of water, but I got through the rest of the explanation without poking holes into it, so it seems kinda stupid to start now. Another horse folklore creature is the Kelpie. The Kelpie is basically a large black horse that lives on the edge of bodies of water. People who touch the Kelpie get stuck to it, and the horse walks into the water and drowns whoever was attached, so I, I think the horse is just kind of covered in sticky glue or something? I guess that qualifies as a monster? All I'm saying is if I worked at the Flex Glue Corporation, I'd throw a sign at that thing. Flex Glue is so strong, it even works underwater. If you avoid taking responsibility for your problems, the next monster is for you. The Tokolosh is a small, hairy, goblin-like creature with long, pointy ears, gouged-out eyes, a hole through its head, a cut-out tongue, and sometimes a tail. This legend comes from South Africa, where the Tokolosh are rumored to sneak out into the night and cause misfortune and hardship for mankind. Since it can't see, it navigates using its other senses. People often blame anything from missing food to serious crimes on the Tokolosh. This is kind of just like the scapegoat monster of this society. It's kind of like the South African equivalent of when a Facebook Karen doesn't like something and wants it gone, but they can't think of anything actually bad about it, so they just start ranting about how it's involved with Satan somehow? Some think the Tokolosh is made when a witch kidnaps a person and undertakes some sort of supernatural and surgical ritual, turning them into a Tokolosh. The Tokolosh is then the witch's familiar, which kinda means like pet or henchman that'll take care of the dirty wook so the witch can keep her hands clean. If I lived in South Africa, this would be super useful. Hey, did you eat all of my chips? Tokolosh. Uh, again? It smells suspicious back here. Are you guys smoking a beer? Tokolosh. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Hey, uh, there's like a bunch of severed arms sewn together in the shape of a big spider in your dumpster. Now, I'm not making any accusations, but... Tokolosh. Oh, sorry to bother you, sir. It must have been hard for you to witness this. 
I hope that goblin stops messing with you soon. Last up is the vegetable lamb. The vegetable lamb is a lamb that's attached to a plant where its umbilical cord would be. Not a remake of The Silence of the Lambs where Hannibal Lecter is paralyzed and has to be fed through a tube. The lamb is thought to grow out of the ground like a plant, and could be grown using melon-like seeds found in the area. It can graze any area it can reach, but its travel is limited by the length of the vine. It's said that the lamb has blood like a regular lamb, but for some reason the meat was similar to that of a crab which makes me really curious. We need to stage an expedition to find this glorious mystical creature so we can eat it. Anyways, uh, one second. Hello, it is I, your neighbor's cat. Stop. First of all, cats don't talk. Second, my neighbor doesn't have a cat. That's a possum. And third, you ruined my recording session twice. Come back to my place again, and I'll kick you in the crotch so hard one of your vertebrae pops out your mouth like a Pez dispenser. You awake, dazed and confused, lost in the middle of the wilderness in the pitch black of night. That's the last time I eat a handful of pills I find on the floor of the bus, you say to yourself. Suddenly, you see a set of bright red eyes piercing through the darkness, and you hear its terrifying call. Stop! You are about to be attacked by a Mothman! You wanna know why? Because you were unprepared. The simple fact is, most cryptid attacks are easily avoidable. You might be asking yourself, what even is cryptid? Cryptids are basically any animal that's existence has been speculated on, but not confirmed by the scientific community. For example, Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, Jeffree Star, or the Kraken. The first and possibly my favorite cryptid we're gonna cover is the Mongolian Death Worm. The Mongolian Death Worm is approximately at least one meter or two to three feet long. All phallic jokes aside, this worm has been nicknamed the intestine worm because it looks like Dr. Frankenstein removed an NFL lineman's intestines and then gave it new life as a giant predatory roundworm. The worm has been said to prey on humans, and it has multiple forms of attack it can use. The worm is apparently coated in a toxin that can cause instant death in any human being that touches it. It can also spit a yellow acidic secretion capable of dissolving flesh. It's rumored that the bright yellow bile attracts more worms to the victim, either because of the bright yellow color or because of pheromones in the spittle. This wormy boy was popularized in Western culture by the American paleontologist Roy Chapman Andrews in 1926. The only evidence that supports this cryptid's existence is anecdotal, so many people believe that it doesn't exist. Some cryptozoologists have a theory about this worm that I personally prescribe to. I don't believe the Mongolian death worm is a worm, per se, but I do believe a creature like that could exist. I think the source of this cryptid could be a large undiscovered species of burrowing legless lizard native to the Gobi Desert. No, I don't mean snake, it's a real animal and there are more differences between snakes and lizards than just legs. While a hot dry ecosystem would dry out a worm quickly, reptiles are much more suited to desert environments. There are also multiple recorded instances of animals shooting acidic compounds as both predatory strategies and a defense tactic. There's also animals who have incredibly toxic skin. The Gobi Desert is the fastest growing desert on the planet, so there's no shortage of sand for this large wiggly predator to hide in. The next animal on the list is the Thunderbird. One version of it is like a giant condor, but this is the boring version. The more interesting depiction of the Thunderbird is a giant sky creature with smooth leathery skin and a head similar to an alligator. This description almost matches the morphology of the extinct pterodactyl, meaning that this could be a dinosaurian cryptid, such as the Loch Ness Monster. Personally, I think dinosaurian cryptids are the cryptids least likely to exist. Not only did they somehow survive a grand extinction event, but they also maintained enough of a population of literal giant monsters to survive until the modern day, and kept this literal pack of monsters undetected, doing it all with the brain size of a peanut. Not only that, but this one's flying through the sky. Do you know how big this thing's turds would be? If that thing was dropping logs out of the sky, we would know. The Thunderbird is reported to swoop down and steal children from their yard. Again, the evidence seems to be mostly anecdotal, and eyewitness testimony is not always reliable. Probably the most famous story about the Thunderbird is from the Tombstone Epitaph newspaper. April 26, 1890, this newspaper published an article where they said gunslingers shot a Thunderbird out of the sky. Some claim to have seen a real picture of the beast with a few gunslingers posing next to it. However, this picture is believed to be a hoax. Some claim that this very picture was published in the newspaper along with 
with the story, but the newspaper responsible for the article was not capable of publishing images at that point in time. Also, there are copies of this article on file in libraries, and it shows no image. Later around the 1920s, one of the ranchers involved in the Thunderbird story spoke out and said that the newspaper sensationalized the story. Apparently how it really went down was him and the others were chasing the creature and the horses became spooked by it, and the creature got away. They never actually shot it down. Like all timeless classics, the moral of this story is just as applicable today as it was back then. That being, everything you hear on the news is at best exaggerated to scare you, and at worst, a complete lie. When you hear the phrase goat sucker, what unholy idea arises in your little degenerate brains? Whatever it is, get that thought out of your head, you disgust me. It's the Spanish to English translation for chupacabra. This cryptid gained notoriety in Texas, Central South America, and Puerto Rico when the bodies of livestock began to pile up, all mysteriously drained of blood. The rumor is that the chupacabra gives other animals such a big zuck that they don't have any blood left. There are two popular depictions of the chupacabra, one in which it's half dog, half kangaroo with leathery skin, and one where it's a bipedal hairless gremlin thing with glowing red eyes and sharp fangs. Some theorize it may be a bizarre species of undiscovered hairless canine, but some scientists have another theory. Many think these are simply dogs and coyotes that are infected with a disease called mange, which causes hair loss and damage to the skin, giving it a strange, monstrous texture. While this version could explain the canine depiction to Picabra, it doesn't explain much about Gollum over here. So that leaves us with two possibilities. Either there's a hairless man-baby creature running around chugging livestock bodily fluid, or a rancher found a psychoactive cactus and saw a spider monkey from 30 feet away and then decided to call Monster Quest. Personally, I am happy with both of these scenarios. Next up is the Yeti. The Yeti is basically Bigfoot painted white. The Yeti is said to inhabit the highest peaks of the Himalayas. Scientists attribute Yeti sightings to different species of bears, or a species of monkey that's native to the area. The big thing about the Yeti that doesn't quite work for me is the sheer size of this lad. The Yeti is rumored to be able to grow up to 10 feet, or just over 3 meters tall, and weigh up to 400 pounds, or 181 kilograms. Now I understand large apex predators can exist in tough environments, but the ecosystem in the highest peaks of the Himalayas is low oxygen due to elevation, meaning that Yeti would need to expend more energy and need more food than another massive creature that lived at a lower elevation. Add to that the energy that it would need to expend maintaining its body heat in such a frigid area, and I'm not sure there would be enough food for a creature of that caliber. If this creature existed at its rumored size, it most likely wouldn't stay up at the top, and at the very least would need to venture down to more observable areas in search of food, which in all likelihood would lead to its discovery. Another primate cryptid that's more likely to exist than the Yeti, in my opinion, is the Skunk Ape. The Skunk Ape is what happens when a mommy orangutan and a daddy Florida man love each other very much, so much that they commit a crime against nature. The Skunk Ape is a large bipedal primate famous for its powerful stench rumored to live in the Everglades. Glades. It just so happens that I am currently close enough to the proposed native environment of this cryptid to go investigating. So I went to a place that calls itself the Skunk Ape Research Headquarters. Upon arriving, I noticed the multiple statues of the Skunk Ape, all for some reason missing hair around its chest raisins. Interesting. After I checked out some of the reptiles they had chilling there like a baby alligator and a gigantic snake that could easily swallow a small child, I directed my gaze towards a cast of what is claimed to be a Skunk Ape footprint. Print. Placing my hand beside it for scale, it looks to be around double the length of the average human hand. One thing that troubled me about these supposed footprints is that they are seemingly almost devoid of the changes in elevation that occur in most primate foot structures, our species included. I'm not making any accusations, but it looks like someone could make a very similar foot-shaped cast by digging out a foot shape in the ground and pouring the casting material in. Regardless of whether or not the evidence means anything, Many creatures that are monstrous in proportion escape captivity and live wildly in droves in Florida now, so there's no reason that a creature like this couldn't exist. If someone told me that an orangutan escaped a zoo, I believe it could survive in the Florida wilds. Personally, I believe the theory that skunk apes are a population of orangutans but I don't see anything in the environment preventing the existence of an undiscovered primate. The Everglades are huge. There's plenty of trees, plenty to eat, and plenty of thick foliage to hide in. The museum wasn't enough, so the only thing left to do was get on a boat and travel down the Everglades. While on the journey, what stood out to me most was the thick foliage on all sides. This definitely looked like it could hide a creature of that size. I saw a lot of big animals and lots of places to hide, but upon first examination, I had not found any trace of the skunk ape. 
I asked our guide if he believed in the skunk ape, he said he did. But if a guide working for that place said he didn't, that'd be bad for business, so that was the expected response regardless. After the tour, I was kind of disappointed that I didn't see the skunk ape on account of it might not exist. After re-examining the footage, I noticed something strange. You hear that sound that I catch right at the end of the turtle jumping into the water? Well, that sound could probably be explained by something rational, but that's stupid. I'm telling you that this is the skunk ape. On the next clip I took, I noticed it. I had found the mother load. And then I went down in history as the best cryptozoologist in history and was still humble enough to suggest that maybe the real skunk ape was the friends we made along the way the end. Human-animal hybrids. What is a human-animal hybrid? Is this a human-animal hybrid? What about this? Have you heard that a team of scientists have created an embryo that was part human being, part monkey? This all started when an international team of researchers got their hands on some crab-eating macaque monkey embryos. They injected the monkey embryos with human pluripotent stem cells and allowed them to develop ex vivo aka test tube baby style for 19 days. The human cells were given a glowing label so that the scientists could track them. Upon the end of the experiment, 8% of the total embryonic cells in this monkey fetus were human. Fortunately for ethics nerds, but unfortunately for my potential Planet of the Apes documentary, the team did not allow the fetus to be born. If a monkey-human chimera were to be born, it would blur the lines between what is considered human and animal. This raises a lot of questions. Will we consider this a human, an animal, or something in between? If you made a cow with human skin and feet instead of hooves, would it be cannibalism to eat it? What percent of this organism has to be human for it to be given human rights? Would something be more human if it had a human brain rather than just a human foot? What about a human-like face? Would I go to jail for giving a chipmunk a massive human penis? Realistically, this kind of experimentation would lead to entirely new fields of research. With all this comes new ethical conundrums, and most likely law changes. This particular experiment took place in a lab in China, so if we ever made a live one, we might not know about it for a while, seeing as how censorship laws there- Nope, nope, stop talking, go to jail. Huh? The being they have created is known as a human monkey chimera. Chimeras often do not survive for very long after creation, but some species are more effective at being chimeraized than others. For example, one previously successful chimera combination is rat and mouse. This raises a ton of moral issues, but if you discard all of those, the possible combinations could be endless. This is not the same as a hybrid animal. Whereas a chimera is a being that has cells from multiple different species, hybrids combine two sets of different species DNA to make genetic material for all of the cells. Like when a tiger meets a lion in a nightclub bathroom after taking nine multicolored pills. Boom. One gestation period later, you got yourself a liger. Ever wonder if a human woman would sign up to have a human chimpanzee hybrid in her vaginus? Enter the proposed hybrid known as the human Z. The first recorded human who attempted to create a human Z via artificial insemination was Ila Ivanovich Ivanovov in the 1920s. I'm sure someone has attempted to create a human chimp hybrid in the natural fashion, but most people probably wouldn't publicize that they did that. Ela inseminated three female chimps with human sperm, but none of them became pregnant. He organized an additional experiment with human volunteers and non-human sperm, but his program was shut down before it could be carried out. Jump to 1977, and one J. Michael Bedford discovered that human sperm could penetrate the outer membranes of a gibbon egg. Don't ask me how he figured it out. I'm sure it was some scientific device, or like a turkey baster. I'm fine with literally anything, so long as it wasn't his dick. It has also been found that human sperm binds to gorilla oocytes with almost the same ease as to human ones. So is this possible? Human beings share 95% of their DNA sequence with chimpanzees, and our other close relatives, the bonobo apes, are reportedly able to create hybrid offsprings with the chimps easily. It's a big maybe, so there's only one way to find out. Hypothetically, let's say someone had enough money to fund a laboratory capable of running these types of genetic experiments. If this same someone were to fund said laboratory and begin to attempt the creation of a human-ape hybrid, would the government attempt to intervene, and at what point? Point. What countries would be the most forgiving of this behavior, and could the aforementioned individual get away with this in international waters? If the individual were to just drop said hypothetical human Z off in a random genetic laboratory with a collar that would say, analyze my DNA, sit back with a beer and watch the chaos on the news, how do you think the world would react? Also, if you were to watch a hypothetical YouTube video outlining a scenario that may or may not violate international 
law, and it happens like 20 years down the road, would you snitch on that individual who made that video? Feel free to choose your words very carefully in the comments below. Fun prank idea, go to a sperm bank and switch around some of the human vials with chimpanzee. Just keep pushing, honey! Can I see my baby? Uh... She already paid, right? There's a ton of really cool science involving chimeras and hybrids, but I need some real evidence. I'm talking like a six-year-old YouTube video of a Russian man injecting his spunk into a chicken egg to make several worm-like monstrosities. Not even joking. We're gonna go through some of the Russian homunculus series. Also, this series is really gross, so uh, you know. Trigger warning, vulnerability. So basically, this guy injects his baby gravy into a pre-chicken, and then he just puts a band-aid on it and waits for a few weeks, and then he cracks it open, and out comes this thing. Yeah. This one is the best. I love that weird worm thing. Unfortunately, weird worm thing spat at vodka land science man's face, and then in a moment of pure unadulterated Russian rage, he obliterates his half chicken son with a book that I failed to Google translate because I don't have a Russian keyboard. After getting spit on, he's not making that same mistake again. He went full Chernobyl suit on us. He stepped up his game. He's doing a full homunculus mukbang up in here. Could you imagine a video collab where this guy works with like one of those food tubers and he cracks open a bunch of homunculi and the other guy just starts shoveling them into his mouth? Moving on. I love how he has his trusty pre-designated homunculus smashing book at the ready in this one. He will not be caught off guard again. Not again. Okay, he left this one alive, and now he's keeping it kind of like an interesting beta fish. Honestly, pretty cool pet, 9 out of 10. It appears to have grown much bigger, and now it is undulating. It's beginning to take on a shape that somehow really looks a teeny bit like both types of human genitalia. That one has an eyeball. I'm not saying anyone owes anyone royalties. I just know we don't want to have to get the law involved. I don't know if those creatures you're making have skeletons, but if they do, your closet's full of them. Things are getting a bit more advanced now. We have the baby of Amoeba and Patrick Starr hanging out with his best friend, a living fleshlight. Name a more iconic duo, I'll wait. And it appears that one of two things have begun to happen. Either the Fleshlight is attempting to vor the eye starfish, or they have combined into one being. I will update you as the story develops. They do appear to be fusing as one being. Yeah, I, I don't think one is eating the other. I, I mean, all of these body parts are just terrifying and wrong to me, so it's anyone's guess. Wow, this is quite a dramatic change. It kind of looks like the Dumbo octopus just a little bit. Oh, he's gonna probe it with the poking stick. Homunculus, <laughs> no, I enjoy the poking stick. Okay, so you know how I just said that they were combining? Now I'm not so sure. Maybe Dr. Frankenstein's fleshlight really was just eating the other one? Either way, it appears to have foregone the head and instead just replaced it with an upward-facing anus. Quite an interesting evolutionary strategy. It appears to have developed teeth, kind of like one of those sea cucumbers that grow teeth in their anus. Do you know what I'm talking about? Probably not. Moving on. Oh my god, look at it, it just ate a raspberry. Nature is so beautiful sometimes. I mean, like, not right now, that's a disgusting abomination, but I don't know, go outside. I don't know if I'm gonna have to censor that. Did it just poop, vomit, sneeze, or bust a nut? I'm not really sure if there's much of a difference if you really only have one hole for everything. Oh my god, is that a fish? Oh, it's dead. It's dead. I was expecting the homunculus to try to, like, eat it or something. I mean, like, other than everything that someone may object to morally or ethically here, at the very least, that's incredibly anticlimactic. Is this real? No, of, of course not. I mean, like, I believe that when I was a kid, don't get me wrong, but there comes a time in every person's life where they have to inject their spunk into a chicken egg and learn things for themselves. It's still an incredibly impressive art project. I have no idea how he managed to make those worm monsters look so realistic. So, homunculus guy? Bravo, this is amazing. Hey, fun fact, did you know 
know you could buy a dead bat on Amazon? Thanks, Jeff Bezos. Real quick, if you like this video and want to see me cover more of Trevor Henderson's creations, please like, comment, and subscribe with all notifications enabled. You should also go watch my other videos covering the Trevor Henderson critters, or I'll throw a squirrel in front of your car on the highway. I'd like to thank MayaBunny23 for this amazing new still. This cult classic artist is in the description of every video. Oh, hey, why? I lied to you. This is just a pork loin I soaked in red wine for like three days and then tore apart with my hands. Mm.